I'm Jim. And I'm David. And, and this, this is the Practical Guitarist Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. Hello, Jim. Hello, David. We had a we had a fun week, I think. Um, both of us have had some some things go on, and some uh, interesting things. All my stuff happened today, actually, um, and really, really ignited me. It's already been mentioned in the group, and would well, you want to talk some... about what happened with you first? Or do you want to talk? Want me to want me to uh, bust up what happened to me? Well, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I saw today. Okay, so. Um, at Guitar Center, I saw a Fender Stratocaster that is priced at $39,999. In other words, $40,000. Now, I will give you that there are probably guitar centers, okay. L.A. or New York, where someone might walk in and spend $40,000. Virginia Beach is not one of them. That's one of the things. And two, they have two versions of the same guitar. And here's what's funny. So. The guitar question is an SRV. Uh, it's it, it's the uh, Fender Custom Shop Tribute Number One solid solid body guitar. Um, obviously, it's Stratocaster. It is. Oh, it's um, only forty. It's only forty. When yep. you told me what it was, now I understand why. But yeah. I'm kind of confused as to why it's only forty because I've heard of those guitars going for fifty or sixty thousand dollars. That's well, that was the shot. That was the surprise. Yeah. So it is in great condition. And of is, course, yeah. of course, because you wouldn't know if it wasn't. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's supposed to be beat to shit. So um, it is the uh, tribute number one solid body guitar. Like I said, and it is truly beat up. It's got all the look. It's got all, everything that you would expect is there. $40,000. And at the same store, they have the SRV Artist Series for right. fifteen. For no, I'm sorry, eleven fifty nine. Yeah, and they and they've been. You know what's crazy? So even though the price of that guitar has gone up, used, they've been going for eleven hundred for a long time. Yeah. So. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting that two guitars that are pretty much the same guitar. Well, let's. I know, that's I debatable. See, that's where, yeah, that's where it comes in. I don't. I mean, I don't. I, so here, I've owned the fit. I've owned the SRV. Like I've owned the, the eleven hundred dollar guitar. Yep. Um, and I can tell you that having played some of the like the custom shoppy equivalent stuff, you know that that not necessarily like the the really road worn stuff. Um, at at uh, CME before, it, it is definitely not the same. <laughs> like no. it has so it has some similar features. Like it has like a neck that's kind of worn into an asymmetrical carve. Um, it has bigger frets. What it doesn't have are the super overwhelmed pickups that you'll find in the player's version, which are not accurate to what was in the original guitar. Um, which is that's you know, there you know as well as I do, there's been so many myth myths that have been spread about SRV's gear. Oh, he played 14s and he had, you know, he had these pickups that were like like 24k and like all this craziness. Um, the only thing that I've heard was kind of shocking when they opened up number one was that 
Number one, it was not a 61. It was like a, it was like a hodgepodge of parts from different eras, like a 61, 62, 63. The guitar was originally owned by somebody else. So it's a very good chance that it was a parts caster that was not assembled by Fender, that was assembled by somebody else. Right. That's the one that was uh, owned by, yeah. um, uh, what's his name? Ride Like the Wind. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Because it was. Yeah. I think so. A lot of people have suggested that. I know he's got another guitar that he's got several guitars that were, you know, that went through other hands, but he found it in a music store. He didn't buy it directly from Christopher right. Cross. That's right. Um, Correct. But the, weird, but the weird thing about it is, like, it's like all these stories go around, right? And the pickups are pretty much bone stock 61, 62, 63 style pickups. Not anything too crazy going on under the hood, except there was a dummy coil. Um, and Cesar Martinez had, I think, it's, no, Renee Martinez, not Cesar Martinez. Yeah. Cesar Diaz. Renee yeah. Martinez had actually installed a dummy coil underneath the, um, the control plate. That's, that's the allegation. And that was le- conveniently left out of the Fender, um, uh, video went for the, um, cause so when you bought that SRV strat that they have there, they gave you a DVD in the case of like them tearing down the original guitar and going through all the specs and all that stuff. And you can find it. It's on YouTube. You can go watch it. Um, but what's funny about it is that, uh, they conveniently left out them, uh, looking in the control plate in where yeah. the, where the control cavity is at because they didn't. So my guess is they probably didn't put the dummy coil in the, the new guitar. But the funny thing is that would change the sound because it would have an effect on inductance. I'm sure. I mean, um, so I don't know. I don't think it's probably that big a deal. I don't think it's like, you know, mid boost or anything like that by doing that, but it's, it's certainly like it, it made the guitar quieter. I don't think it made the guitar silent, but he certainly, um, there's a lot of people indicating that Renee Martinez was, um, really kind of concerned with, with, uh, the neon lights at the time and noisiness. So didn't he do work also on, uh, SRV amps? Uh, that was Cesar Diaz. That was Cesar Diaz. Yeah. That's who I was thinking. C- Cesar Diaz built pedals and amps. Um, and even like his super reverbs, they're not really super reverbs. Like no. a lot of people thought they were super reverbs, but they had been gutted pretty much. The, whatever circuit was inside those. Yeah, he had completely, is, yeah. Who knows? Gutted it and rewound everything. Yeah. Um, well, Philip Sacy, who's a big devotee of that kind of sound, he sought out Cesar Diaz before his death and got some amps quote unquote modified um but you know modifications don't take enough time that you would have to stay with the person in order to get it done and apparently uh philip had to stay with him for several days so i i have a feeling these were not modifications so much as uh let's take this circuit board out and let's put this new one in not not circuit board but turret board out and put a new one in <laughs> you know it's like a, yeah um significant rebuilding and revoicing of the amps but we know that stevie had a uh an affinity for the uh, vibroverb like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, his sound was very super reverb-ish, but he was a vibroverb guy. Like, he liked the 15-inch vibroverbs because he could get them in and out of his car in the early days. Um, I know he still played supers from time to time, but I wonder if he had his circuits converted over to vibroverb spec and were running 410s in mm-hmm. those in those uh, super reverb cabs that he had, like, in the old combo thing. And he also played a lot of freaking Marshalls, too. And people don't re- people don't like ever give him credit for that. He played um Marshall Club and Countries, and uh, he had uh, I know he had some super leads and stuff. And you can see him like in his back line from time to time. You get these pictures of him playing like you know, big shows, and like he's got like a dumble back there, and there's a Marshall and um some of the shows. So he had he had a couple of dumbles. He had the he had the um Eric Johnson turned him on a dumble, and he got uh he got uh, the Overdrive special. And then he didn't actually like that all that much. Now, I've heard varying reports of whether he gave it back. Because yeah. um, some people have said, well, no, he sold it back to Dumble. Or he gave it back and then, and then Dumble made him the Steel Strings singer or singer, whichever it is. And so that was like his go-to Dumble amp, which was basically a modded super reverb. Um, and, but <laughs> I have a hard time believing that story. I think he probably kept it. Because uh, if you if you heard like you know they couldn't stand the weather sessions and stuff like that, um, they apparently mic'd up like fifty sixty amps in the studio, and they were just like fading in what they wanted, um, for you know each track. So the dumble was probably there somewhere, 
in that in that mess. Probably one of my favorite SRV songs. Just couldn't stand the weather. Yeah, yeah. No, and a great tone on that song. Sounds like a double. Oh, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible sound. So yeah, no, I mean, so your your uh, suggestion here is like, what? This is an expensive Strat, or that this is like one that? I mean, this is a collector's item. Is what? This right. Is. That's exactly what I was going to say. So, so that, that's what I was going to get at. This is not the kind of guitar you would take and you would play at a gig or anything like that. You would put this in a glass case and go, look, I've got an exact copy of the Ravon Strat. Here's, I, and I get it, but I just don't, I don't understand the logic of purchasing a an amplifier or I mean a guitar or any kind of stuff like that. Yeah. At that cost, that's just gonna sit in glass. Yeah, well so that's my thing too is like when those came out there are twenty thousand dollars. Right. Yep. And I kind of sit there and I scratch my head and I go, that's just on the cusp of like being outside of playable territory for most people. Right. Because because I mean people play ten thousand dollar guitars. I mean I've seen ten thousand dollar guitars on stages even yeah, locally. Of course. Um it's not something that I would do. I mean, I'm, I, I would have a panic attack. Um, but I could see, I could definitely see somebody who's in that realm, like you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars custom Gibsons and stuff like that. Um, going, yeah, twenty thousand dollars, I could have a copy of SRV's guitar. I'll take it out. But the fact is, they never sold for twenty thousand dollars. Maybe the first buyer paid that, but after that, they they immediately went up to the forty, fifty thousand dollars. Bracket. In fact, I've heard of them selling for as high as one hundred, but I don't know that that's actually accurate. You know, they, you, things get legendary real quick, right? Like, du there's a couple of dumbbells that have sold for high dollars like that. So everyone's oh, they're worth a hundred thousand dollars. No, they're not. They're worth well, about thirty to forty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's a possibility that um, let's say because these are serialized within the series of customers. Sure, shops. and there was and only, like, was 100 only like yeah, yeah, was it all, all um, a hundred or less? It was a very small limited run. I think it was under a hundred. Yeah, so given that number, if let's say you had the first 20, um, you know, you had a really low serial number, that might indicate that you were um, like I'm, maybe number one of the of the series. I'm not saying that number one is be any better well, than number I 99. Always just, I always just laugh at that because I'm like, serial numbers don't really mean a whole lot in terms of like, oh, well, this guitar came off the line sooner, but that doesn't mean it's any better than any of the others. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's that would be a perceived well, value thing, I guess. Well, that's what I'm saying. But we have to do. We do have to admit that it was a custom shop series. Ergo, there was a lot more hands on, and by number, say thirty or forty, your hands might be a little more tired than they were at number one. I'm not I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm not saying that that could happen or did happen. I'm just saying that it's a possibility. Sure, sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, like. It's it, it, there's a very spe special particular type of person that would be interested in purchasing this, and that that's okay. Like I, you know, honestly, um, if if I had that kind of bread to spend and like that wasn't, you know, that wasn't I, if that if that was worth two thousand to me, like me now, if I had that kind of money, yeah, I'd probably buy it. To be honest yeah. with you, um, just because like that guitar is only going to go up in value, it would be actually that's one of the few things where I tell you like that's a good investment. Um, those are highly sought after. They rarely come on the market. Um, and just, you know, put it in a vault somewhere. Like, that's all you can do, really. I, you're not, you you are not going to take this thing out and play it. Like, right. the vast majority, because the value is not $20,000. It's $50,000. You're not Joe Bonamassa. Bonamassa right. could buy this and take it on stage. John Mayer could buy this and take this on stage. But the average dude, like, that's not going to happen. Even right. Even your average, you know, Half a million dollar. If somebody pulls down a half million dollars a year, is not going to take this on stage. No, it's just not going to happen. So, it is what it is. Yep. Cool. Cool though. I'm. I, so you. So you've seen it in person now. What you? What you think? Is it slick looking? Because I. Because I thought they were. Because I've seen one before. Um, they do look like the real deal. <laughs> so the uh, the yeah the cool thing is that uh, so, um, one of the things that uh, people who have worked at Guitar Center probably know this, but. Um, when you when you get when they get a guitar like this in, they have to take several pictures, and they're asked to take picture after picture, even ones they don't post. Take picture after picture yeah. after picture, and then and then there are pros who go through these pictures. They can't just take a guitar like this in, right? Because they gave the person probably close to thirty thousand dollars for this guitar. Yeah, and they and they have to make sure that it's legit too, because there could be a fake. 
you know. That's right. And it, and uh, in this kind of possibility, they can't afford that kind of money to go out. You know, even though people say, "Oh, it's just this much money, guitars that are afford it." Let me tell you something. It, it doesn't matter what kind of place it is. I hear that all the time. Oh, it was it was just this much money. A thirty so thousand dollar hit can close a retail store. That's right. It easily close a, a, a full store. So anyway, um, it it's the real thing. Um, looks nice, feels nice. Um, is it my thing? No, I, I've said before, I like, I like to make something feel the way I want it to feel. And so the wear and tear on something would be my wear and tear and not necessarily somebody else's. Uh, so, um, that's why for me, a guitar is, you know, if you don't have the time to spend on a guitar, I can understand the, the desire to get something like this. Um, but for me, I'd still rather wear and tear my own things. Yeah. I mean, well. And this is a guitar that's beyond broken in too. Let's let's yeah. be realistic here. Very it's much a guitar that's been basically. If it was anybody else's hands, it probably would have been trashed. Um, because it because that guitar had been completely mangled. Like it was. I, 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 he was he had been told on the on the last tour that that neck had to be retired because it was it, it couldn't take another refret. Yeah, and so he had. Uh, if I. Correct me if I'm wrong. He had a couple of backups to this, right? He had one called Lenny. He had a book. Well, they weren't really backups per se. It's just other guitars he had. Yeah. Um, Because he, so he had, a, at the end, he had, I think it was a double humbucker Stratocaster. It was given to him by, um, a Luth, well, it was actually given to him by Billy Gibbons. But Billy yep. Gibbons had it commissioned. That's the one that has SRV in the inlay. That yep. probably would have been his replacement guitar for that. Because that's what he was using in place of number one on a lot of gigs. But he got about halfway through the final tour, and he was like, "Uh, uh-uh, put the put." They put a different neck on it, and he was playing it through most of the tour. And then he got about halfway through, he said, "No, to hell with it. You're putting that neck back on there." And then, of course, the other story, of course, is that he had been told that he was getting carpal tunnel syndrome, so he had to get away from the 13s and the high gauge yeah. strings. So he went down to 10s. When he put the new neck back on it, he went back to 13s too, because he was like, "This we're not we're not doing this. It's just not working." Um, yeah, I can't imagine the wear on a set of uh, frets with 13s like that. Yeah, well, that's the thing. He had bass frets installed. He had like the big, the biggest bass frets that they could get and put on that thing because yep. they were just. He would chew through it like I, nobody I I know other than Steve Morse has ever had a guitar that like where the where the technicians like no this won't take another refret because it's gonna chew through the board too bad. Yep. Like that's that's a that's a rare thing. But being that he was using that that big a gauge of strings, like he was probably just eating frets. Oh, um, for much. Um, so the other thing um, that did happen to me is I returned the Princeton. I could, I couldn't get the volume out of it. I wanted. Oh, the, the solid state Princeton you bought, yeah. Yep. So um, I returned that. So I'm still kind of looking around for a practice amp. I'm buying. I, I'm looking. I haven't bought one yet, but I've been looking. Like I, so I have an allowance, right? I have a little bit of money I, every month that I put away, and. Mm-hmm. I haven't bought anything with it. Like I bought, I bought a couple of like little stupid things, but um, I'm getting to the point where I could buy a practice amp. Now I have the, I have the Kemper. Kemper's great. Um, but I'm looking, I want to get like a PV Rage or a PV uh, Bandit or there's a one in between. There's the Rage is the eight inch Bandit's the, the uh, 12 inch. Yep. I forget what the one in between is, but um, I've got them both, all three of them are reverb feed. These camps are cheap, man. And they don't sound the best, but like for playing clean with a, you know, with a drive pedal or something, I would be fine to get through practice or rehearsals with it. And they're, they're light. And if anything happens to it, I just laugh and not care. I mean, that honestly, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So, uh huh. There's a locally, there's a Roland BC 60, I might. Um, B- Blues Cube. Yeah. Those are pretty cool. Well, it's a, it's a tube. No, they don't. It? Roland's yeah, never made. One's... No, Roland's never made a tube amp. Yeah, this is a uh, tube amp. No, I'll send you a link. Incorrect. Roland has never made a tube amp. That is their their uh, their tube emulation technology. Yeah. BC, the BCs. Yeah, it's not a tube amp. They look like them. That would be pretty amazing. If they did. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get. You, I'll have to get you a picture of the back end. Yeah. Um, Either that or somebody stripped that stripped out the interior and put some in it. Which wouldn't be the first time somebody used a um a case. Cool. 
Yeah, so you're talking about a BC-60? Hmm. Hold up. Sorry if this is uh, boring anybody who's listening. But trust me, it's going to get real real, uh, real raucous here in a minute. Uh, yeah, so 60 watts RMS, solid state, heavy-duty 12-inch spe speaker based on a greenback, uh, yep. Akatonic Spring Reverb, yep, uh, Tube Logic technology. So it's not, that's, yeah, solid yeah. state. They're cool. Um, I've I've actually played a couple of those over the years, and they're pretty good. I I would say um, they're they're significantly better than the uh, the next tone or whatever that that other thing that uh, Boss is doing now. It was just kind of the same idea. Um, so anyway, moving on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some stuff in the group. Before we do that, we're gonna talk about uh, some audio hardware that I bought at Sweetwater Gear Fest. And uh, I mentioned this in the group this afternoon. Uh, this like, kind of all went down this afternoon. And Jim, you may you may uh, be kind of getting informed of what's going on here as part of this conversation. So I get uh, last week I started having some issues with my PreSonus uh, 1810C, which is an audio interface. It has uh, four inputs on the front, a couple more in the back. It's got SPDIF. It's got you know ADAT. It's got everything I need. Right? Um, I could run a small project studio with this thing. It wouldn't be the greatest thing in the world, but I could. Um, so I bought this thing because it has all the ins and outs I wanted on it, right? But at GearFest, um, I approached them because I'd owned another PreSonus interface prior to this that was a piece of junk. And I was really honest with the, with the sales rep. I was like, look, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brutally honest with you. I had this interface before, and it was a piece of hot garbage. And you guys didn't support it. And you didn't, you didn't keep the drivers coming out for it. And I basically bought a paperweight. And it was junk, and I threw it in the garbage. Um, and he was real apologetic and he's like, well, he's like, I can assure you that, you know, that, um, that that's not the case now that every product we bring out, you know, we put a lot of support behind it. Like you have good drivers and, um, we don't have a diversified product line like we used to because of that, because they wanted to unify everything and he just, you know, touchy feelies. And like, I really hope that, you know, this works out for you, whatever, like, you know, th thank you for considering our product. So I bought the 1810 C I'm like, I'll give him a second chance. Right. So remember, um, I had a Steinberg UR22 before that, which is not the best interface for recording guitar. Uh, and there's some various reasons for that. But anyway, um, the Steinberg, like, I didn't really have any problems with it. Now, I use it with Cubase. Um, so Steinberg obviously makes Cubase. They, they are part of Yamaha. Yamaha and all that. Like, all these products are tightly integrated, right? Um, so I'm using this 1810C to record with Cubase. And that's where things started to become iffy, right? So things worked pretty well when I first got it. Um, I don't like the mixed console software. It's kind of clunky and um, it's kind of hard to follow, like having, so I have this mixer software and then I have the mixer inside Cubase and they're two separate things. And oftentimes, so basically all the mixing for the 1810C is just monitor mixing, right? So I can mix like, to going out to my to my monitors on my desk here, my headphones, and I can have three different mixes going on, and I can do all that, or I can go into the DAW and I can record things and mix and you know do all my post stuff that would actually be printed to the track. Now, this is where things get iffy, right? So, I have my monitor set up. It's my computer speaker monitor set up, right? Like it's the same thing. I don't I don't switch back and forth. If I'm going to play video games or something, I use my JBLs which I also got at GearFest. Um, great monitors, by the way, and I paid like nothing for them. They were 150 bucks for the pair, and they are phenomenal for the money. Um, but anyway, I have problems switching from Cubase to other applications and back to Cubase. And you'd think, oh, well, that's not a big deal. But if you're working on a project, like a work project, because I've got, you know, Premiere going, and then somebody sends me a Skype for Business message, and I flip over to that, and then I flip back over to Premiere or Cubase or whatever I'm working in, and then my audio won't switch back, or it switches back improperly, or worse yet, what was happening to me a lot was the interface would just lock up completely, wouldn't do anything. So I, after about 45 minutes of screaming at this thing the other day, I finally said, you know what, I've rebooted twice, I've reinstalled the drivers. I have done, you know, I did a number of things. I was like, I'm going to pre-sonus with this. They issued another driver update 
the week prior, and I didn't have any problems until that driver update came out. So I figured there's probably a bug in the software. So I go to PreSonus and I write this message uh, in a ticket. I say, when switching from DAW back to Windows and back again, which in this case is Cubase Pro 10, it is constantly causing Windows to be unable to send audio through the device. Basically, if I'm working with the, with Cubase open, everything works fine. Then it says, uh, I close Cubase, the 18, uh, 1810C loses audio connection or freezes. Technical support rights be back. Says, please send me your computer system info file. And they give me instructions to do that, which I already knew how to do that. I'm in IT. Um, so I went ahead and fired that off to them. In the meantime, um, before I fired it off to them, I'd already made some changes. I, I rolled back to the previous driver, just being intelligent, knowing that, you know, hey, that works for me. Um, and that actually caused more problems. I couldn't get the mixer application to even open. So then I wrote, or they wrote me, or I wrote the back and with the info file. And I said, please note that currently I've rolled back to the previous driver from June. Um, nothing appears to be functioning now, but that might show, uh, but the uh, NFO might show some anomalies in my system config. If you'd like me to get back to the, or if you could like me to go back to the current driver, I can. Uh, I sent it to him. All right, that was on uh, Tuesday at 10.52. I received, um, and, and here's where it's funny, right? So I didn't get a notification from their email system until Sunday. Mm -hmm. But apparently they responded to me at Tuesday at 1246, which was no more than two hours later, right? Um, so I said, they, they said, thank you for the file. It does show that your 1810C is connected and installed properly. No, it's not. I'm using the previous driver, right? Um, and then it, said, it also shows many things running at startup. You should disable these and restart your computer, then retest. And then they closed the ticket. Like it was done. L like it was done. I'm like, wait a minute. And, 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 and of course, I'm in tech support. So if you just tell me I have a bunch of stuff running at startup, that's like brushing somebody off. Like I know, I know I've had those conversations with people around the office. It's like, that's like the put in a ticket and I'll come back and deal with it later. But this is probably what's going on kind of thing. Well, I already have the ticket. So um, this, is, this is Butch Richard, technical support rep at PreSonus Audio Electronics, by the way. So, um, not to out him completely, like, I'm sure that he's got a manual that he's reading out of, and that he's, like, yeah. not really... Like in... most of your text Yeah, people. he's probably not, like, the guy that caused this, right? So, I respond, and I'm pissed, right? Because I didn't get this till today, so I'm like, it took you four days to brush me off? Like, what? <laughs> um, so, I, so, now, coming back, I respond, and I said, in a realistic use case, startup applications are unavoidable. Your hardware is being deployed in a variety of environments, from home studios to project studios. And I would assume other places. However, given my, uh, my, my experience with the product, that's probably not the case. Um, Windows, are, uh, to assume that everyone has a totally squeaky clean install of just Windows is absolutely absurd. If the PreSonus driver can't play nice with Steam, Discord, and Skype for business, then it's, because those are my startup apps, right? Then it's not really realistic that uh, that it should be deployable outside of some squeaky clean dev environment. Some of these applications are licensing applications for DAW plug-in products too, which is also the case. I have the uh, Steinberg licensser and some other things that are, that are uh, running. So I've like, I, my next part is I've worked in information technology help desk tech support for almost 20 years. Never have I been told or had to tell a customer or client that they are running too many startup applications. The assumption with products is that they are compatible with the uh, with other operating system applications. That's how this is supposed to work. Usually, you might have a log of known conflicts, and you can give specifics rather than generalize. And for, uh, I don't, this, I'm just so angry. Like some of the things I'm saying here don't really necessarily make sense. Um, <laughs> and and forgive me, but you make things up because you don't know what the real problem is. I spoke with a Presonus sales rep at Sweetwater Gear Fest about the quality of drivers that Presonus has put out. Uh, in the past, and basically told them that a prior experience I had with the company had soiled your reputation with me. Nevertheless, I went home with an interface to give your company a second shot. I could have purchased any of the hardware interfaces I had wanted. I could have bought an audio interface. I could have bought an RMC babyface. I could have bought an Apollo Twin. But I gave PreSonus my money because I thought it would be a better value, and I was assured that your driver team, as well as the quality of the interfaces that you were pr producing, had improved. It's becoming very clear to me that I made the wrong choice and have wasted my money Ooh. again on PreSonus. Never again. This support case is further evidence of this. By the way, I fixed the issue myself. It required me to update to the newest version of Windows 10, which they just had 1803 came out, right? 
And I noticed that they came out right around the same time. So my guess is if I was running the older driver on 1803 or whatever the, the current version of Windows is, it probably wouldn't have worked. That's why they issued the update. So I'm like, I, I basically said, then reinstall the driver. Everything works fine now. You might want to log this so that if someone else complains about a similar issue in a high-end workstation, you won't lose another customer. What a joke. I, I, what else can I say? Like, I, I, I'm still ticked off that they closed my ticket and brushed me off. Like, that's ridiculous. You know, Dude, I spent so, 400 some dollars on this interface or 300 bucks on this interface. Like, at least don't, don't throw me under the bus and be like, oh, no, it's just you. Dude, I have a, I have a $2,000 workstation sitting next to me. I'm no joke. Like, I know what I'm doing. This is craziness. So, long story short, um, I, I went on Twitter and I, and, and, and I sent him a message and I, and I tagged him in it. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Thanks for brushing me off. I'll never buy another one of your products again and I won't recommend to anyone else. That's ridiculous. Like, at it, bare minimum, I should be, I, just like with Windows, if you buy a license of Windows, you pay $150 or $175 for a license of Windows, guess what? You get one support call for free. Where's my free support call? Right. Right. They, they literally took you. Now, and this happens at work, too, for me, is that IT, the first thing they do is they say, well, your problem, close ticket. And, you know, I've been in where that's the there's there's motivating factors to that. Well, I just laugh. Typically cause coming because if I did that, if I did that in my work, if I said, no, I'm just going to close this ticket because I don't want to do it. I get shit canned. Oh, yeah. But that's because they know you. You're a you're a you're an you're a face in the crowd. Right. And they don't they don't care. Right. This is ridiculous. So that's fine. I'm going to um, I'm going to crank this up the ladder and I'm going to probably keep squawking until they shut me up somehow. And I'm hoping they shut me up by taking this interface and shoving it up their rear end. Um, well, so that I don't think you'll get that. You I might get hope. a replacement or re um, not a replacement, but uh, um, you might get a return. I don't I'm not. A Look, I don't want another 1810C if they're going to send it. I just keep the one I got. But because uh, it works fine, like as long as the drivers work. And, and, and so Robert Jackson commented on my thread in the group about this. And he goes, um, he goes, I've had good experiences with their customer support. And I'm like, I, you know, I, I, but he said that was for Studio One. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'll bet you if I was running this on Studio One, they'd be like, oh, we can help you. We're, we're going to help you as much as we can. Like, we'll do everything we can for you because they're not selling hardware. You know what they're selling? They're selling Studio One is what they're selling. And I'm sorry, but like Studio One was not even a DAW that anyone cared about five years ago. It was it, it has developed quickly and rapidly, but mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but a product like Cubase, which has been around for almost 20 years, is far more mature. Um, now, granted, I'm not a huge Cubase fan either. Like I've switched away from that application several times because I don't, I don't feel that it is set up for people who need to be able to record quickly, right. um, and, and to capture the moment. It's very much like a, let's set up your project. Let's set up your ins and outs. Let's record some tracks. You know, it's like, it's very like an arduous task. You almost have to like rethink the way that you do things, um, instead of just plugging it in, you know, hitting record. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm look, I, I'm willing to try studio one. I have a license of it now. I mean, I bought this thing. I have, uh, I have various plugin licenses that go with it. I'm not mad. Like, let, let me, be, let me be very frank here. I'm not mad with Sweetwater. Um, actually my Sweetwater at Brant Miller, uh, steered me towards several other interfaces that I probably should have purchased. Um, but I, I didn't want to spend the extra money. I was already dropping like an insane amount. And I was like, I only need this for like a year or two. And then I can get a really nice interface and hopefully I'll be in a house at that point and like I'll be able to like set up a real studio and you know. So I'm kinda like I'm 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 frustrated with myself, but I'm not because I know I can get through with this thing. I have a backup interface, I have the UR twenty two underneath the desk. It doesn't have SPDIF, it doesn't have ADAT. So I would have to figure something out as far as that's concerned. But it's not that big a deal. It, this is not this is not the end of the world for me. I just I'm frustrated because it's like you buy a product, especially a software or hardware product like this, which is which is high tech. I mean, let's face it. Nobody knows a whole lot about what goes underneath the hood of these except for the engineers that design them. Um, and I'm just kind of like flabbergasted because it's, you know, what other recourse would I have? 
if the driver they, they put out for this thing was no longer compatible with the current version of Windows, you, there's nothing you can do with it. It's junk. Um, so you're at their mercy. Like, it's, this is that's why I said, like, when you buy, and I think I've mentioned this on the show before, when you buy an interface, one of the really difficult things that you have to you have to consider is that you're not just buying the hardware, you're buying the software too. Because the drivers that are are, are often more important than the physical hardware. Um, so they uh, long long story short, um I've been I've been kind of pissy about UAD products. Um I've been skeptical. Uh they're a walled garden. There's some things I don't like about them, but I'll tell you what, everybody at Sweetwater was using UAD. Um, all the uh the sessions and stuff I was seeing were done with UADs. Um, and they sound really they just sound fine. They're not super expensive. You can use them with a ghetto laptop that has like no hardware in it. Um, which that's kind of a benefit. You spend eight hundred dollars on your interface and you got you can plug it into a four hundred dollar laptop and it sounds fine. So I, I may go UAD before it's over with. I hate the walled garden thing, but I'm in the middle of one right now. I got a Kemper, so might as well. <laughs> well, you know, when you buy when you buy a device that is, uh, you know, um, what's the word I want? When you're buying a device that is that is um, software driven. That's where you. That is where you wind up. The the cl the closest thing and, I can consider is like buying a cell phone, because yeah. you. I mean, when you buy an Android phone, like you're Google or Samsung or whoever's mercy, for for software updates, and product updates, and security fixes, and all these different things. And it's no different when you buy an audio interface. This is not like buying a, an old analog console. You know, you don't buy it and then that's it. It's there, there's this relationship that has to happen between you and the company and. I mean, I they, they just soiled me really bad. Like that was not the appropriate way to handle this conversation. What they should have said was like, "Well, you know, we don't really support Cubase because I know what was really going on. They heard Cubase and they were like, no, we're not touching this.'" And it's like, "Fine, then just say that. Be like, you know what? We would highly recommend that you look at Studio One. And if you're having problems with it, you know, switching back and forth from Studio One, then you know, then we can start to diagnose the problem a little bit better." Or, or right. even some, or even something as simple as like, look, you know, um, make sure that your Windows OS is up to date. They do have an NFO file, so they can see what version I'm running, because um, obviously they they pumped out this driver update because something was not working properly, you know, in the mismatch. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not like that's another thing. Nobody communicates, especially with the hardware vendors. I have never seen a a driver release notes for. Um, like pre-Sonus or anything like that, because they don't want to admit what the bugs are. It, you know, oh, when I of course not. when when Helix issues an update, right? Like, so they came out with their big update a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, two point eight finally dropped. And um, when it came out, like they had a release notes, and you could read the release notes, but you don't see that for bug fix releases and drivers, or if you do, they hide it. You know, they don't want you to see that 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 text file somewhere that tells you like this is what we fixed. Um, or, you know, this is what we address it may not be a fix. It may be something they had to modify due to, you know, updates in windows OS, et cetera. But, you know, right. that's, that's what gets me is like, this was about really, I can tell you what the problem was. So this was about the, um, pre is switching from the ACO driver to like a WDM driver or the regular windows core driver, and then switching back to ACO when I would click on, on, uh, um, when I would click on the Cubase window, but actually what was really funny was that it works fine when Cubase is open, which tells you that Cubase does something with that switch. And that when you close Cubase, if you don't have it switched to the, to the, you know, whatever's going on in the background, it doesn't switch properly. And then the, then the, the interface is just like, I don't know what to do. Like I was, I was in ACO mode, like, Hey, um, so it's, there's something funky going on there, but it's working now. I'm not complaining about that like i just wish that they had handled the case with me better i would love for them to take this thing back to be honest with you because i would take the uh, the 300 bucks or whatever i spent on it i think it was 340 with the with the sale deal and go and get um go and get a um uh a uad or something because because this was just like i bought this as a stopgap, and i was hoping that 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 pre had really fixed everything because 
I looked at the competitors. I mean, look, what else am I going to buy? I'm going to buy a focus rate Scarlet, you know, because um, I need Spitif. Like, that's that's the main thing. And this had Spitif built in. I didn't have to have a converter because you can go from, I guess, ADAT to Spitif. There are converter boxes, but I just, I'm like, I don't really want to have to buy like a $40 converter box off of Amazon that's made in China and who God knows what it's doing to the signal, you know. Um, but maybe that's the route I end up going. So Spitoff is pretty much dinosaur age right now. Like, I'm surprised that uh, Kemper is still trucking with the Spitoff connection. Oh, yeah. Was... We did talk about the Kemper stage last week. Um, it's out now. Um, it's the streets this week? Yeah. No, I actually think it's already hit the streets. Some people have them already. Oh, really? Yeah, they were oh. out They were out during the announcement. Um, British Audio was selling them. and uh, Well, Sweetwater's got them, but they're already yeah, they're they, sold out. Yeah, they blew they out of them like, immediately, and I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't sell them all the staff. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm not, like, the, the big joke right now is, of course, oh, you could still build, you'll spill beer on it. You spill beer on the other one. Oh, well, the remote's cheaper. You can always replace the remote if you spill beer on it. Um, I don't think anybody wants to spend $400 to replace the remote if somebody spills beer on it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that doesn't yeah, make any not exactly... sense. Yeah. I don't, I, I just don't care. Like, I came from the Helix world. Like, we lived with that. You know, somebody could spill beer on it. So what? Um, you have insurance. If you don't, you shouldn't be, exactly. you know, you should be, like, real clear on what you're doing. Um, or you should have a, a protector, which they do make. Um, so I don't know, like, I, I don't really, I don't even want to get deeper into that discussion, but yes, the camper stage is out. Uh, it looks cool. I'm not really that excited to buy one or anything. I'm like not running out to buy one. And, um, they didn't add any features really. It has the same features as the stage pretty, or as the, the head pretty much. Although well, it does have a new firmware, which means we will be getting a new firmware soon too. Yeah. There's two things that, uh, does it, it does have a new firmware, and there isn't, at least at the moment. That's probably realistically never going to happen. Uh, there is no powered version of it. Yeah, it's probably not. You'd run this. It's probably not. And yeah. and you know what? Uh, for this product, like it doesn't need to happen. It's no. it's the the whole idea behind it is the convenience of being able to go direct. So I I just don't think that it's all that necessary. And to be honest with you, like I probably should. So. The, the thing is, the powered version is so convenient. Um, I could have bought a stereo power amp and bought the Kemper unpowered, and it probably would have been a better fit because long term, like if I get to another product, but it's just like I'm just gonna have amps anyway. It's not a big deal. So, um, but uh, yeah. So there's that. I sold my SG. That's now in the hands of somebody on on its way to Argentina. And um, really, yeah, I made. Uh, I made significantly more money than I thought I was going to make on that. $200 more than I paid for it originally. Wow. And um, that's... so that's money is in the hands of my wife hidden somewhere in this house so that um, I will, well, I don't know. <laughs> she, she may have put it in the bank, um, but just put up somewhere so that I will be able to purchase a, another guitar later. Um, yeah. And so this is, this is an interesting and relevant conversation, right? So like I've been playing seven string for a while a couple of weeks now and big wide necks, right? Um, yeah, I, I have carpal tunnel now. Oops. Um, and it's, I don't know that it's necessarily the seven string that's done it. Like I play, I have a very specific style of playing and, um, I, I'm a keyboard jockey for work, uh, which is a big part of it. Um, but yeah. I, I do a lot of repetitive stress on my hands. So my wife, uh, she has carpal tunnel and she gave me a wrist brace. And I've been playing with a wrist brace at my seven, and everything seems to be clearing up. So as long as I make sure I wear the wrist brace a couple hours a day, or you know, two hours a day, or whatever, like I should be golden for playing, continuing to play the seven string. Um, and I, my original, I I panicked when it started happening originally because I'm like, you mean I can't play a seven string? Like I'm gonna have to go back to six? Like this is awful. Um, but I'll get through it. Like it's fine. Everything seems to be working now. This is why I'm not running out and buying another Kiesel right away because I'm like, I need to make sure that I'm going to be able to work with what I get. Um, and then, of course, I can always buy a six-string Kiesel if I really want to. Or I can go, actually, I would probably go Warmoth if um, if I had to pick, you know, whether I was going to 
I would go warm off and then assemble the guitar myself and then have somebody else set yeah. it up. Yep. Um, cause I, then I can get whatever woods I want and I can see the woods in some cases before I buy them. So yep. that's kind of nice. Yeah. It's always nice to look at the wood before you buy it. Yeah. I don't, I don't like looking at wood. It's just not my yep. thing. It's somebody, some yep. people's thing. Some people like yeah. it. Yeah. It's a thing. It's a thing. We're ta- are we talking about grain or are we talking about, uh, Never mind. I'm not going to uh, follicles. Well, if you get there and it's and it's like and there's no tone in it, what the hell's good? What the hell good? Is? Right. Well, so Mike, Mike, I lucked out on Mike Easel. Mike Easel sounds great. Everybody's played. Yeah. It's like wow. Um. So I don't know. I mean, Nick, Nick played it. Like Nick can comment in the group. Uh, Kish has played it. Kish Kish likes it. Um. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I don't know. Like. Now that I, now that I kind of sit back, so we had we had a topic for this week um, that just kind of came out of some com- side conversations that were going on in the group um, between me and some other people, and it's because we, if you don't know, like uh, Jim and I are super approachable. Send us a, send us a yep. Facebook message. We'll talk to you. Like we don't care. Um, yep. And we, but we have like side conversations with everybody who's pretty much active in the group to some extent. Yeah. And. Um, yep. Just some of these side conversations, like we, there have been some some kind of critiques of things we've done on the show, and like that's fine. Like we we, we encourage that because that's how we get the show, make the show better, right? Um, but yeah. but I wanted to talk about what our audience is because I think we've I think we've scratched the surface on this before, and then we'll kind of parlay this into the, you know like audiences at musical events, and then we have some other topics we're going to drive off that. Um, but. What is it, Jim? What do you? What would you characterize our audience? I know we're on the same page with this, so I can let you talk for a while. I'm, I'm starting to, my, I'm getting hoarse. I think that the um, the majority of our audience um, is practical in a lot of different ways. We've talked about frugality, is that's a word, being frugal. Uh, we've also talked about um, uh, some of the things that people do. Um, I think, I think that we're geared or hopefully geared more towards reaching out to people who um, want to make more of what they have um, without necessarily having to constantly add on and constantly make modifications. Um, but if they do make modifications, it's in a, it's in a, an appropriate um, manner. It's not, um, well, only these guitars are good for blues and, and you're not cool if you don't play these and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, I posted a uh, uh, thing in the group. Uh, it's a photograph of uh, a promo that our friends at um, Guitar Center have, and uh, I had to laugh because um, there's some people that are oh, that are that definitely hipsters. That are that are they may not be actually hipsters, but they're acting hipster. And uh, there's a guy playing a cajon. Um, but there's also two people playing those ninety-nine dollar Epiphones. No woman, no crap. And there, yeah, it's, and there's a woman in the background. They've got these these looks on their faces, like I'm so excited to be playing this guitar. And then there's a there's a woman in the background. She's standing behind a keyboard with this look, like look at me, I'm having so much fun. And then I got a big Porsche. They're dressed like you know, they like, either just mowed the lawn, or like they're super hipsters. Yeah, like it, it, yeah, and, and it's like the a port you would picture like um, from uh, uh, Song of the South or from um, what's that uh, that movie Forrest Gump? Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's this big Southern porch. This you know, I don't even know if it's Southern. You know, I can see that in Portland or something. Like, but yeah. it's a porch, and like who play? Who has their band come out and practice on the porch? Like, no, in but. all honesty, like this th- this photograph should have been in a garage. It should have been a well manicured garage, but a garage. Right, right. I just thought it was pretty funny. Um, that uh, the cops and, showed up uh, shortly think... thereafter and issued them all citations for being too loud. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't think that. I'm not saying that people who play like that aren't in our audience, but I don't think that's the crux of our audience. I think our our audience. I'm hoping that we've been um, targeting folks who. Um, just want to do their own thing and they're not worried about falling into um you know uh a well-defined um silo of 
this is the kind of music I play or this is the kind of thing I do or whatever. Um, I And they're looking to get somewhere with guitar. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I, my response to somebody who actually we were talking about this with, I said, I, um, I want to make it clear that we accept all people with an open mind to play guitar, meaning people who actually care about their instrument. Um, we are not a gear cast as much as a guitar podcast, and we want to include people who love the instrument in a positive, non-confrontational, forward way. We are not about stirring up trouble or creating controversy for confrontation's sake. We don't care uh, who you are, man, woman, right. old, young, other, straight, gay, smart, stupid, human, or extraterrestrial. If you love guitar, that's who we try to speak to. Right. And I, yeah, I think that's... honestly, like, I it's good writing, but... I, I, I'm tooting my own horn. It's probably terrible writing. Um, but I, I wrote that the other day and I, and I read it a couple of times after I said it and I went, no, I have to say this, like this, this needs to be said this way, which is that, yeah, there's a little bit of humor in there, but I mean, that kind of like reflects the show where we're, we're infotainment. Um, but for the most part, like we, well, we're totally acceptable. If you're a hipster and you like our show, like by all means, um, participate in the group. If, we, we, we like to be challenged. If you're an Area 51 resident and you want to be um, with the group, then hey. So this con yeah. this concept, this is this modern concept of the echo chamber, right? And I think um, I think we have a tendency if we're in gear groups. I, I'm in a lot of gear podcast groups, right? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that like that hasn't tainted my opinion in some of this. But the other groups I'm a part of are like the Helix group and the Kemper KPA group and um, some of the P Dubs groups, which I don't play that music, but I'm interested in it. Um, all of these groups that I'm a part of, uh, I see like fanboyism and stuff going on really bad. And like it, it the, the cultures in them are, are very strong and they will start on people in or out like one way or the other. And it's, it's, um, it can be a really confrontational culture and we don't want that. Uh, I don't want an echo chamber either though. And that's, that's what you get in like the, the line six group. Is like, oh, the Helix comes out and everybody makes a b bunch of jokes about the Helix stage. But I'm sitting there laughing because I'm like, do you know that like probably 10% of the people in this group are considering buying the Helix or the uh, the Kemper stage? And and 10% of the people over in the Kemper group are looking at buying the, the Helix. So it, y y your your core audience changes and, and the way that you perceive each other changes. And like those people get thrown under the bus if they say something so they keep their mouths shut. And there's a whole like... A lot of this stuff going on, I'm just sitting there kind of like scratching my head and I'm going, this fanboyism stuff needs to stop. Like, how are we ever supposed to um, – it, it, it takes comp competition out of the equation for equipment. Do you know I, what I mean? Uh -huh. I think that the uh, – this is my take on it. And, folks, if you if you don't agree with me, you know, that's that's fine. I, uh, you can We're not an echo chamber. voice your opinions. But, right, I think if you're, if you're looking for an echo chamber, then just look in the mirror and say stuff. Be, and then be much happier. Wait for it to come back, and then respond. Because <laughs> it, and that's right. Because if everybody's going to agree with you all the time, then that's just great for you. But what is that? Well, from a from a product standpoint, it's awful. Because right. if you think about it, so like if you if you let's say you remember the Helix Group, right? Because this is the, and this is the real world case I'll give. Um, actually, let's let's make it more interesting. I remember the Katana Group as well. And the Katana group is hilarious, and I've talked about this before. But they they they'll say things like, "Oh, I sold my Bogner Ecstasy 101B, which is like a four thousand dollar amp, and the cabinet, which is a thousand bucks, to get my Katana 50 watt uh, combo." No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Quit it. Like everybody knows you're full of crap, right? So. Why would right. you say something like that? Everybody knows you've never owned that, or if you did, you sold it because you had to pay for a car. You know, or something like that. Right. You had, like, yeah, you had bills. And just be honest. Hey, I had yeah, to get out of like, it. No one cares. Go Nobody's going to ostracize you for that. In fact, if anything, it says a lot about the Katana that, you know, you used to own this, but you had to get rid of it. So what did you do? You didn't downsize to a Marshall. You bought a Katana instead. Like there's, there's something you said about that. But anyway, my, my point is, so if you're in the, if you're in the Helix group, right? And everybody's like, oh, everything else sucks. And you're not really open-minded to what other people are doing. And you don't really realize it's an echo chamber, which is, which is why echo chambers are dangerous. Because you have to keep in mind that, the, that you know, this is a Helix-centric group. Um, and a lot of people don't. All of a sudden, like, the, the Axe effect sucks. 
anything that Fractal puts out sucks, and anything that Kemper does sucks, anything that Boss does sucks, and anything, you know, like any of the competing products are not are not the Helix, which is superior in every way. Um, and the reason why that's a problem is because then it reduces competition. Because people aren't like, oh, well, you know, this one does this, and I really need that. So I'm going to go buy that. So then the next time when, when Line 6 makes a Helix 2, they don't include that feature because nobody jumps ship over it. You know what I mean? Like, it's it, it's almost as though these 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 things are reducing the need for selling points. And so it's fine to just make a cookie-cutter co- copy of the same product, which is why... I think the Kemper stage has been taking flack because it's not a cookie cutter copy of the Helix or a head rush or a GT 1000 or, you know, insert product name here. Now I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that one of the products isn't superior or that it's not superior for your needs. Like the Helix has a very specific group of people that would, would enjoy using that product. The GT 1000 has a very specific group of people that would enjoy using that product. It's a very small group of people, but it it is a group of people nonetheless. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was my little bit of a, attempt at some saucy humor there. The um the head rush has a group of people that would use it. And 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 actually the head rush um I think is is the more interesting of the of these cases because the head rush is not claiming to be as good as the other products. It's claiming to be easier to use and it's claiming to be cheaper. And when you wrap your head around that, like I at first I kind of poo-pooed the head rush because I'm like, you know, tone, like tone, you know, and then like now I'm starting to think about it. It's like, well. For what it is, that's not necessarily a bad product. If you want to go right. cheap, like there it is, you know. Um, so um, we're going to do the value segment. I'm intending to go do some value shopping this weekend, um, this coming weekend, um, and then once that happens, then I'll uh, hopefully have our first couple of products to talk about on this show. Um, the first one I already know what it's going to be. It's a pedal I already own. Um, actually, it's probably going to be a pair of pedals I already own. And then we'll have some other stuff. But basically, I want to do one a week and then or one, uh, one a week for a while to get people familiar with the, the concept. And then we can move on from that. But um, yeah, so I think all the things you said, Jim, about our audience are true. Like we're looking for people who are practical, meaning that they know that you don't need that that $40,000 SRV number one guitar to go out and play a gig. That's craziness. You don't need it. You don't need a PRS to play a gig. Like you don't need a PRS core series to play a gig. It helps, but you don't, but you don't need it. Like you can no. get by with, you know, a uh, uh, Fender made Mexico Stratocaster or, um, you know, anything, anything really. I mean, I, people play gigs with squires. It's yeah. really about being a good player. And that's, you know, we talk about gear a lot on the show, but I cannot downplay the importance of actually learning to play your instrument. Um, it's really easy to forget that with all the gear and like the obsessing over what you're going to buy next and like sitting down and thinking about planning on a pedal board and all these different things, you just forget that like this is supposed to be fun to play. I think that's where people lose the. Um... They lose the drive because it stops being fun and it starts being work. And eventually it starts to drain on the, whether it's draining on the pocketbook or it's draining on the, the mind. Um, there's a, there's an old saying, play more, buy less, um, or whatever. And the thing is that if you're, if you're sitting down and, um, learning to play, which we used to talk about a lot, and we're moving back in that towards that direction. Um, that's where we want to be is focusing on, okay, how can we better give you, the listener, um, different things about playing? Like, uh, David, you posted uh, a thing that you had written, you composed. Yeah, gear, well, gear Gnosticism, you know, like. Even if we're going to talk about gear, like we talk about it in a like, let's not focus on a specific piece that you should be buying, but like more general, like okay, let's talk right. about overdrives and how they work, you know right. what they do. Um, and we've had this conversation before, but yeah, but no, like exactly posting, you know, music examples and things like that. Um, yep. we Jim and I practice this stuff. Like Jim actually goes out and plays gigs and hosts open mics and everything else and falls off stages, and uh, 
<laughs> hurts himself. <laughs> and uh, I, I get out from time to time and I, I do a lot of recording around the house and uh, I write a lot of music. And, they, you know, we need to get back to that core of, um, of what the show's yeah. about and talk, stop talking about, uh, you know, these old man brands like, like Gibson and Fender. <laughs> Right, <laughs> which we're not talking about. What, what? And then I'm not, and and today's thing about pointing out that guitar isn't talking about oh Fender Fender custom shop. You've done blah, a blah, complete. Kind of I, I have to point out though, Jim, you've done a complete 180 since we started this show. You were all Pips, PRS Gibson, all right, Pibson. Yep. Um, in Pibson. the beginning, and matter of fact, I I had a Pibson early on. <laughs> I had a Mister Pibson. It was uh, <laughs> a I pepper got it flavored at, drink. Seven Eleven. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I love Mr. Pipson. <laughs> so anyway, he's a he's a Pipson guy in the beginning of the show, and now what are you playing, Jim? Do you own a Gibson? Mexican Strats? I have one it's somewhere. Have one. It's yeah, somewhere. But it, it's, uh, yeah, but it's um. Yeah. The thing is, uh, when it comes to this, I'm playing. There's there's three Fenders and a Schecter behind me, and there's another Fender over here that you can't see. So it's a Squire. There's a squire. He he's and three. I can grams. remember him saying to me, like, I just can't I can't get with single coils. Like I just can't do it. You yeah, yeah. single coils and all this stuff. Except for this one. This one has a has a humbucker. Well, one humbucker is not gonna hurt anybody. I've got one. One humbucker is not gonna hurt anybody. I do have one humbucker. I can say this though, when it comes to the humbucker, the problem okay, the problem is either you should either play humbuckers or play single coils. And this is why I say this, and I know you people that are that are doing both. I do. It's really hard to tame the animal, tame the beast, when it comes to the humbucker. If you just switch out, I mean, you could do it, but you got to have your settings ready. For you know that. what? You because... know what I do, Jim. This is going to be a weird like concept for you. Go ahead. I finish your part first, and then I'll tell you what I do. No, but I do it. I do it. I do it mid song. A lot of times, I just use the humbucker as a lead tone. And so it's funny because I'm using the neck pickup that, that there you go, you got it. Background there, and then I switch to the um, bridge and I go into a lead tone, and then I come back In, out. So HSS configuration is sort of popular with like the hard rock crowd, and there's a reason for that, right? So like you're playing through pretty gained out amps. There's not going to be much dynamic mm -hmm. difference between. There's going to be a total difference, but not so much in dynamics. Um, cause they're not really hitting a clean amp usually. Now I know people are going to write in and say, Oh, that's not true. Like I get it. Everybody's rig is different, but, um, I actually, so you know what I do, Jim, when I want to, when I want to dial back, then I switch yeah. to the split part on my Kiesel where it's split yeah. between one pickup and the other. I get a single coil split, right? So I only get one of the coils yeah. and it, what it does is it like drops the volume a little. Just a little bit, not a lot. Yep. These pickups split really, really well. Um, probably the best split pickups I've ever had. And but anyway, just split, switch forward. Then I got my rhythm sound, so it's not like super gained out. And then when I want to go, and it's chunkier too, which is nice. And then when I want to go back in lead mode, I just flick my hand across it, and it goes back in lead mode. Um, yep. And I think, I think there's a lot of merit to. Um, Using a double a double hum guitar with a with a split like that in that way, I'm not a guy that's going to tell you, hey, if you want to play Strat songs, just take your Les Paul and like, split the coils. No, don't do. It's right. not the same thing. But but you can get away with it for a song or two in a set. Like it's just not gonna. I wouldn't recommend you do it all night long. Don't don't show up to your gig where you should be bringing a Stratocaster with your Les Paul, you know, with a, with a, a push pull split on it. Like no, that's not what you do. Like, what do you what do you got going on here? <laughs> um, so, I think there is also a tendency when it comes to pickups to be like to look at pickups. And go, this determines what I'm going to sound like. Very much like, oh, the humbucker is going to completely. You know, if you roll that humbucker back, and this is something that I had heard people do, and like it's just it was an old school thing that I never really thought about doing. But Nick was doing it at. Um, gear fest and he was rolling to pick up back to like five or six right and then getting yep. the amp sounding where he wants it to so he can just roll up higher if he needs if he needs a higher gain and i haven't really been practicing at all all that much but i but i've been doing it with the keys a little bit and i and i think there's certainly merit to that um and that's another way that's another approach to the same problem which if you're dialed in where your where your pickups sound really good at like six you got four more 
you can use to kind of like get into different territories. The trick is don't dial all the way up when you hit it. You know, don't go from don't go from four to ten all the time. Okay, so this is where we talk about some of the um, things that people have expressed to me when they they ask me about their, especially with folks who play humbuckers, um, because you have different type of pots, right? And the problem is a lot of humbucker pots are set up so that they they're not an even taper. So when you um, you mean a, they're not linear go, taper. Or they're they're not a audio taper. They're a linear taper. L- linear, yeah, linear. Yeah, so they are linear, right. is what you're saying. Right. right. So they're not when they when they're hitting that. Yeah, they drop all at once. They, they get pretty much. Yeah, they lose everything at six, mm-hmm. and then they gain everything at eight. And there's really nothing to be had between eight and ten. There's just compression. At yeah, I'm a big or fan of say audio taper. Ten. Like if they're linear tape, and I've had some guitars that came new with linear. First thing I do is rip yeah. out, rip them out. And put it on yeah, your because it. it's just not usable volume. Like, if you have, it, let's think about it. You got a pot, right? And only only forty percent of it's usable, it usable range. What are you doing? Like, you got this sixty percent there that you can tap into and do all these colorful things with. Highly recommend audio taper. Um, unless yeah. you're, you know, unless you're balls to the wall, always, you know, on ten metal. Like, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, right now, should you change your pots, you know, if like the guitar's cheap and whatever, like, nah, that's all the way up to you. But I think that's a definite player preference thing too. Some guys like to do that, that swell thing, you know, where when you're, you can wrap your pinky around the, the strap volume knob and get it to like violin, that you do like a violin bow effect. Um, I think if you're using audio taper, that might actually help that, but yep. yeah, yeah. My problem with, okay, so with the strap pickups, um, as far as playing a strap, because I do love to play a strap, I'm always bumping that volume knob. I know, you talk about it constantly. Yeah. You still haven't gotten over it, have you? I still don't get, I still don't, I tend to dig in, I guess it's a, it's a, um, I mean, I bump my. I it's bump a thing. Mine. I play. I play closer to the bridge. I bump my. I so bump I mine. Guess. But you know what? You know what? The thing uh-huh. is, like, I'm I'm habitual about turning it up. Like, yeah. and and the other thing is, um, I don't. So I do play. Clo- I play really close to the bridge, um, a lot actually, and uh, it's. I don't know. You just get used to it, like, because I've played nothing but strats for a super long time. Um, it just. It was easier for me to just be like, all right, now that I got this style volume knob, like after a couple of days, I just don't bump it anymore. Um, now I, I, I say that I had top hat knobs on my, uh, my other S 500, the blue one, which is still for sale if anybody wants it. Um, and the top hat knobs were wider and I was bumping them all the time. So I went to the, to the neural like telly style knobs, the dome knobs on it. And now I don't bump yeah. it as much. I also, nice. if you're going to use strats, like I don't like the really loose pots either. Like the, you know, the, the PRS has the, the real loose ones. I'm not a big fan of that yep. um, on strats. On other guitars, like P, like uh, Les Pauls and PRSs where you're not going to wrap your pinky around the volume knob, like they're, they're great because you can just reach down, grab it real quick. And, and I like in the time it takes you to do this, suddenly your, you know, your volume has changed completely. Um, and you, and you could be right back to playing. You can do it in the middle of a, in the middle of a rhythm section even. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if you have to take your hand away from it, you want to lose pot. If you, if you're going to be bumping it, you definitely don't want to lose one. Cause it will just like, you'll be all over the place constantly. Um, now I've made some suggestions to you to how to fix that though. Take the volume pot, turn it into a dummy pot, and then just use yep. the middle tone pot as your volume. And you'll never yeah. bump it again. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've been looking at. So that's an easy enough mod. Like I know a lot of people have done it. So, um, yeah. I don't know. So uh, Kish asked in the group, and I thought we were going to try to be able to push this into the audience discussion. We didn't really talk about like audio performance audiences. We've talked about that before in the show. You can go back and dig through older episodes, um, and you, and you'll find us talking about you know knowing your audience, which is which was actually a pretty good episode of her call. 
Um, all our episodes are good episodes, right? Like, you should listen to everything in our back catalog. I'm sure there's nothing in there that's garbage. That's correct. The first 20 that's episodes right. are the best material we've ever – no, they're not the best material we've ever done. Um, actually, <laughs> if you just want to skip the first 20 or so, like, that's cool. Like, we're good with that. You was crazy, Jim. I look at our statistics. We still got people listening to like early episodes. Like, what are you doing? Why? Isn't that awesome? It's good. Isn't it's good. Awesome? I hope that people listen to like a couple of the new ones first and then go back. Because if you listen to like number one, you're not going to listen to this show. <laughs> it's just not going <laughs> to happen. Not. Um, so I've been told lately, uh, actually a friend of mine is starting a podcast for his work and he was like, listen to my show and he goes um he goes you know you you are born to be a podcaster and i said and i thought to myself like is that like an insult is that like <laughs> you're not yeah you're not sure like, is, it, is that good is that thing? good or is, is that, that like a... is that like you know did i break it high school is that good no um it, it i honestly like took a moment and i was like wait a minute so that means like i'm i'm i was destined to like sit on the couch and laugh at tv or something like it, 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 being a podcaster is not that glorious, folks. It's just Jim and I thought our opinions were strong enough that people might actually laugh at them every once in a while, and so exactly we decided to do. A and podcast. that's what we really want. Um, but anyway, so Kish Kish asked, um, and he's thinking about like jamming with people, right? What are some standard right. songs and riffs that people use to have group jams? Things like Twelve Bar Blues, etc. Um, I think he answered yeah. his own question in the beginning there, but uh. Because yeah. twelve bar blues is like the big thing. Anything that you can play with a twelve bar blues is is huge. Definitely. Um, songs of the sixties and seventies, like I think just about anything that you can say. Okay, what's the key? Um, so I'm going to give some standards. When I grew up, I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the songs I grew up playing and still get pulled out to yeah. today. And so they they have a, a certain length of time that they've they've existed. And I'll call and, it out if I know. Right. So I'm going to start right off with Louie right. Louie. Know it. can play that. Right? You can play mm-hmm. it all day long. Pick a key. Mustang Sally. can play that, too. It's 12 bar. One, yeah, four, it's, five. A, it's a variation on 12, 12 bar. 12 bar blues. Right. That's right. Pick a key. Um, Born to be Wild. Yep. Pull out a key. Matter of fact, right in with Born to be Wild, Bad Case of Loving You. Yeah, and they're I, very uh, similar. Um, I don't actually yep. know that one. Per fact, se, I would, I would but not recommend. I could play that one. Yeah, it's doctor, doctor, give me the news. I've got it. A... Yeah, as long as somebody that's, that's on stage knows it real well, like these tunes, you could pull off. Yep. And that's that's the thing that every what what I'm getting at is every one of those songs that I mentioned really revolves around three chords. Okay, and they are the one, the four, yeah. and the five, and so. Now, the only real difference, so that's why I, re- I don't recommend playing Bad Case, Loving You, and Born to be Wild together, is that they're so close. There is a little variation in the chord sequence in Bad Case, Loving You, that you'll get stuck in playing Born to be Wild, and you won't get out of it. Because honestly, it's, it, they're that close. They're that close. Um, so what does that come to? I, I can play... Uh, um, Going to uh, some different types of music, um, uh, some different types of progressions uh, that that are at least a little more more interesting. Um, Dirty deeds done dirt cheap. Any ACDC tune? Oh, so many but, ACD ACDC played the same song for twenty years. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> That's basically... but at least right. Um, uh, the um, well, Dirty deeds done dirt cheap. TNT. Uh, that. Almost that whole Bon Scott era. Um, if you uh, want blood, I think about like Rosie. if you want blood and all if that you stuff. Want blood. Like... Um, the, the the only real um, three chord song uh, that they had at that time was um, the uh, um, oh, what's the one uh, about um, in the beginning? Oh yeah, let there be back rock. Nineteen fifty five. Yeah, let there be rock. That's that's really the only one where you can say, okay, kind of got three chords. Or the rest of their music really had a lot more chords than, than three chords. I'm not saying they were, they were yeah, but they're but, yeah, but simple. so like I, I've been in I've been in situations like open mics where somebody's like, oh, I'm gonna play, let's say you know, if you want blood, like I, then then all of a sudden I'm like, 
I don't know if I can play that. And then I hear him play like the first three or four, you know, measures of it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I got this. Cause like, I just saw how they I do it. This. And I'm like, all right, now I got it. Yeah. Um, and so, um, if you wanted to look at uh, music, that's a little more today. As a matter of fact, I have a list. You did not know. Check this out. I actually he has have... a list, folks. Hold on, hold on. I have a list of songs. I'm going to read. Oh my you. god, that's a long list. We're going to be here it for is. a couple it's, hours. And, folks. And there's songs on the... Not really, no, because because it's only one. It's only one side. The other side is the right. artist. So I'm going to go real fast. But these are songs that I've jammed with band in bands, and they're actually not that hard. But they're going to be all over the map. Yeah. Are you ready? So I'm going to I'm going to kind of say the name of the song. I'm not going to list them all. I'm going to name the name of the song and then the era that it came from and the kind of music it was. So This Love by Maroon 5. Okay? Pop music, early two th- mid, or, well, late 2000s. Right? It was about 2008. So 2008. Couldn't tell you. Um, the Pina Colada oh, song. God. If you like Pina Coladas. Okay? 70s pop. Right? Baby Come Back by Player. All right? 70s pop. Um, but I got Inside Out by Eve Six, uh, Mr. Jones by The Counting Crows, No Rain by Blind Melon, oh. okay, Santa Monica by Everclear, uh, Story of a Girl by Nine Days, 1985 by Bowling for Soup, Santa Ria by Sublime. Now Santa Ria, I can get a job. See. Yeah, I get a job with Shanana. From no. Offspring. <laughs> yeah. Get a job. I kind of wanted to put, um, I was thinking about um, Pretty Fly for a White Guy, but Get a Job's easier to sing. Oh uh, hemorrhage by, by Fuel. I have a hemorrhage right now. Brain hemorrhage. Um, if You Could Only See by Tonic. Second Chance by Shinedown. Believe it or not, those are pretty much the same song. Uh, Sex on Fire by Kings of Leon. You ever want to jam a new, a relatively yeah, like, new these song? Yeah, like these it's There's easy. some good examples. I would never play any of these songs. No, I, I would. Yeah. This would be where I'd be put see, my put my guitar in my bag and be like, "No, no, you guys take care of this." Like, <laughs> now see, that's just it. You know, you've got, um, you know, I, and that's okay. You know, we we are not playing the same. Absolutely type of music. not. Absolutely. Well, no, I'm not. I'm putting, not slamming because... this stuff. Like, it's just I would not. No, I wouldn't but, fit into but, this context. That would be if I was. All right, if I was putting a blue space band together, I would have had Couldn't Stand the Weather, okay? Hey, Joe. That was the one I was going to say. Like, had... that's the big jam band tune for, for people like us. Hey, Joe. Um, yep. I would have had, um, uh, you know, Honky Tonk. Yeah, Women. that's another good example. I would have yeah. had. Great, great song. And the, and the interesting stuff about that music, obviously, is how you can, you can take it and form it into your own right. thing. The songs that I mentioned earlier. You, Louie Louie. There's enough people that don't know Louie Louie that you can take that 145 and you can do your own thing over it. You can, and that's the beauty of 145. And I think we can both agree. Um, hey, Joe is a great all along the watchtower. Yeah, I think uh, that's a really hard one to do to an open mic or a, a jam, though. Well, it is, but it, it but it, that said, all along the watchtower is relatively oh, simple. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like you can show somebody that in like two minutes. If you can say, hey, bass player, do this, drummer, do this. And then you can solo over that all night as long as you right, know right. all along watch time. Uh, Sultan's a swing's another you know. song like that too. It's got yeah, six chords in it or something, but I mean and if you've got a if you've got a wah pedal and uh you can cock it open um about a quarter of the way. Cause that's where that that's where that wow 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 that's Sultan's that, a swing. I don't think so. Oh no, I was thinking of uh I was thinking of some uh, of the other songs like Walk of Life and what's the one? Down, 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 bow, down, 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 bow. I like Derek Strait's, but look at that! Oh, uh, money, money for nothing. For nothing. Yeah, that's, that's what the... I was thinking. You said I had to sit there. Yeah, I thought there was a. I thought there was a Les Paul with the the tone knob rolled all the way down. That's a that's a Les that's a um, Les Paul with tone knob rolled in the car. I didn't know you did both. I didn't. Know I saw an interview both. with. Yeah, uh, that doesn't surprise me. But... Yep, yep. But that, he was very. I, um, that's where uh, Slash got some of his uh, his ideas was. Yeah, right there. But but anyway, what I'm saying is, um, and I, and I, obviously you need to jump in because I'll I'll show you these two albums that I was listening. No, to No, I in think my car. so. I I want to start off and just tell everybody like where Jim's at with these selections are great. 
And yes, uh, he's got that's what Motown's greatest hits. I can't Grand Funk Railroad something like that. Jimi Hendrix. Jimmy Hun- oh, Jimi got, Hendrix. Oh, Smash I hits. thought you were showing me two different records. He's got Experience Hendrix, and he's got Jimi Hendrix Smash Hits here. And actually, yeah. I think that's a great place to start. Um, there are other bands that I would recommend too. Rolling Stones is like really where it's at. Rolling Stones. Because I mean, so many of their yeah. songs are like super simple, and they're all about attitude. And if you're gonna play like you're gonna you know try to ham it up and sing and like do simple guitar work, like that's really where you should be where you should be looking. Um, I think about things like uh, Monkey Man and stuff like that. They're not complicated songs, but if you can pull them off, they they are great. Um, if you're gonna just play with friends, uh, obviously Little Wing is probably. I've heard many people who are very much better guitar players than me say that's their favorite song to jam with other people over because the chords are not typical, but they're but no. they like they they lead to some very interesting things happening. Um, I like um, Hey Joe. I like uh, even like Crosstown Traffic and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, and and so like any anything Jimi Hendrix is going to be like perfect for me. I'm a huge Hendrix nut anyway. But uh, actually, I've had good success playing like Guns N' Roses songs with people too. You know, it, so the problem that, that I have when – so when you walk into an open mic – I was, I right? have one more band, but go ahead. Go ahead. Led Zeppelin. Go ahead. Get up Led there Zeppelin. and play Communication Breakdown um, since yep. I've been loving you. Although, good luck finding a drummer that can do that one. Um Moby, Moby Dick. Dick. Well, <laughs> four of drummers, you know. Um, no, but but in all in all honesty, well, we play we played a version of Moby Dick live, which was really fun because uh, our drummer was like he was nuts and he would just sit there and solo for twenty minutes. Um, so we would just all like let him go nuts. I can tell you one of the one of the most fun songs I had that's relatively easy that that uh, bands um, it does take a little bit of work get the intro and the bridge, but Radar Love is a yeah, fun that's song. another good one, and it's. And it's so easy to play over the, you know, I've been driving all night, my wings went on the wheel, you know, because you're just playing and be my Yeah. Well, so so you really have to know that yeah, song. Go ahead. Though. That's the thing. Like, if you're, it, you're not going to show that to someone two minutes before you play no. it, but enough people know that song, no. you might be And there's able to get a lot more. Them. Right. There's a lot more chords. And that's the thing that people will, people will tie, try harder. To do a song now, I had so um, this other project I'm in. Um, the guy said, "All right, here's a song that I want you to learn to, for tonight." This was last last week for tonight to play at the open mic. Sure, go ahead and throw it at me. Okay, it's um, uh, cap my cap, and um, it's by a band uh, that is from the '60s, right? And I thought, oh, this will be easy. I know that song. It's like, why don't we just play Whiter Sheet of Pale instead? <laughs> exactly. It was, it was just like that. <laughs> so let me get the the name of the band because it, people would know oh, it. That, um, I ha- I saw a guy one time try to attempt that, like come in and he actually wanted to do Whiter Sheet of Pale. A closer closer to home. I'm your where captain. Were, my grand where, where was railroad. That at? I don't. Know, it was an open mic, and it was this was years ago. But the guy's like. He had he had a keyboard player and and uh, I mean, he had a full band. And he came in, and he was like, "We're going to do Wire Shade of Pale." And it was it was bad. And I and I I like why would you even? I just like there's some that's, songs that that I, honestly that's one of those few songs where like the the performance they got on record was just magic to begin with. Um, and then to right. try and like do that live, I don't know. Procol Harum, uh, that's Robin Trower was in that band. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like a lot of Robin Trower music, but that is not something I would encourage people to play in an open mic. <laughs> well, it's like okay, so here's some here's some songs that are great and popular. I would not try to bring an open mic. Boom, boom, out goes the no. lights. Pat no. Travers. I've okay. heard people say stuff um, like that too, like anything off the Pat Travers "Go for What You Know" record. And I'm like, are you on drugs? Like nobody yeah, even knows insane. that record. Like unless you're a guitar player, you're not gonna know that record. You're not. You're not gonna go up there and be like, "Let's and play some Robin Ford." Like what? That's a, 
that's a song where he introduces it. You know, they start with the drums and the guitars. Yeah. Then he goes, we're going to play a little boogie yeah. boogie number, you know, and, and it's just an old rhythm and blues. This is boom, boom, out go the lights. And, and, and there's like chords. Yeah. All over the place. Well, Pat, he's, he's changing chords more, more than um, uh, he changes. Pat, words. Yeah. Pat the, Travers <laughs> is like a guitar player's guitar player. Right. Um, the fact yeah. that there were vocals in that music was just incidental. And uh, yeah, yeah, not a, not a, not. I would not encourage you to be like, oh yeah, let's go show up this open mic and we'll just get up there and we'll see if there's anybody that know any Pat Travers tunes. Like, are you on drugs? Like, <laughs> I mean, you came from a different planet, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, let's get up there and play some mahogany rush. Like, what? <laughs> okay, here's yeah, or or Mob oh yeah, Re- oh no, well, I played some Mob Vishnu yeah. <laughs> Orchestra stuff before, so that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's not hard, not easy. Um, then you've got, uh, uh, so, um, here's another one. That's a great song, really well known, would not recommend it for open mic. And it's, um, oh crap. I just had it and it, and it flew out of my brain. That's I what saw, happens when you break. I saw somebody old. try to attempt to do, um, uh, cause we've ended his lovers from Jeff Peck. That, that was entertaining. Oh my good Lord. Well, why don't you do something easy? Like, oh no, just hat. turn around and tell, um, like, tell the bass player. It's like, oh, well, no, it's, you know, it's like a, a one, two, one, two, seven. Uh, flat five, and then and then you know yep. like what? Like don't who forget thought, the ad who thought that was gonna be a good idea? Like just follow, just follow along, it'll be fine. <laughs> Chuck Berry tunes are are great for this stuff. They are fantastic. Um, for jazz. Steely Dan no, is not. Uh, I have thought about Alan it Parsons several times. Like oh, I'm gonna play Kid Charlemagne. Like. Ain't nobody gonna be able to follow that. Like, it's, it's, you know, here, let me show you. Let me show you the charts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, there's only 18 yeah, pages. The charts, okay? no less. But, but remember, remember that page nine goes back to page seven. But when you get to the second bar on page eight, you have to go to page 12, and then you. Take all right, it all right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. So, the what's the stuff. worst tune that you could possibly think of for this kind of thing? Because I have one in mind. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you ones they, that people constantly try to do. They do it badly. Okay, a relatively simple song. Okay, Born, Brown Eyed Girl. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. They just no. I. If the guitar player doesn't know the intro, that that little um, double stop, it goes to shit faster than you can get it started. And uh, that's a that's a perfect song. That look, there are some great easy songs. But that's not uh, one of them that you should pull out. An honorable anyway. mention, ahead. worst disaster you could try to pull off is YYZ. <laughs> but um, YYZ, I, yeah. I could see Great some one. people trying to do that and just be like, "What are you I've doing?" Seen it. Like, um, I've seen it. I've seen people actually play it too, which is that's impressive. Um, no, I've seen yes. the train wrecks because they have the first. They have that intro riff. You know what is that? Uh, one yeah, five, five or whatever. Is, but, the, um, uh, and then. They train wreck yeah, it from there. That's not an easy song to to try and pull off anyway. But anyway, so um, yeah, that and then the one that I, I I've seen people try to do Moon Dance. Oh, good lord, that's another one. Like Jesus it sounds Christ. simple. I mean, it, it does until you realize what those yeah, chords are. Like that's I mean, there's a reason that record won a Grammy for for like you know composition because it I mean. Now you're referring to, yeah. to Van Morrison, right? Yeah, it's dude, and that has a yeah, great guitar it. part on it. Like, I would, I would rock that song oh, so yeah. hard. But um, Fantastic. I have never like felt like I've had a band of guys on stage with me that be like, "Let's play Moon Dance," you know? Like, everybody would just look at me like, "You go to your mind, like rock and roll hoochie coo." Rick that's Derringer. great. I honestly have seen people just crash and burn that one too. Yep, they did de- de- because they go. To- <laughs> Honorable mention: the, the the worst crash and burn I ever saw was a group trying to do Black Dog. Oh, good lord! You're yeah, talking about I, Zappa, my right? worst crash and- because of the time signature that they think it's four four. It's my not- worst crash and burn was oh what uh, Key to the Highway or something like that. From Eric Clapton, and it wasn't oh, my Eric fault. Clapton. Like I, I, like, I'm not a Clapton <laughs> fan. I'm the first guy to tell you that. Like I don't know that song very well. But the guy that I was playing with, he turned around and he told me 
He's like, it's a one four five, except that instead of a instead of a dominant seven, it goes to a major for the for the five, five. chord or whatever. And I'm like, okay, no big nice. deal. I got this. And then we started playing, and like yep. he couldn't figure out where he was supposed to be, and he was doing the vocals too. So I'm like, oh my god, like this is a disaster. So I just walked all over him the whole song. That's basically what I did because I was like, I, somebody's got to save this shit. Like, <laughs> you know, you know what saddened me? I was watching. This is silly. But I was watching a live version of Wildfire by Mark, Mark, Michael okay. Mark Murphy, and he was doing it, and he was screwing up his own yeah. timing. It was like he couldn't find probably a bad monitor mix. The one, I mean, that's that's it, what in I was all thinking. honesty, like I've had that problem just jamming my own tunes here at the house, where if I can't hear things loud enough, yeah. like I'll be off. And I've been playing, um, so I've been doing some more grunge tunes uh, around. I've been playing like some some Allison Chains and some. Uh, uh, some sound guard and some sound guard. Oh, Allison Chains is fucking yep. wonderful. Um, no, I know what it sound is. Sound guard. I'm kidding. Sound I really guard like is Allison Chains, and I do like sound guard because because I tell you what oh, song. Yeah. What song do you think I'm I'm playing? No, uh, Black Hole Sun, Spoon Man. No what? Oh, and geez. I don't play it in drop D. Nice. No, really? I'm playing it on my seven string. Well, because you got the seven, and I, so I'm just I'm doing this the whole time. It looks like I'm. It You're making looks up. like I'm yeah. like one out of the neck. I'm, I'm sorry. I know that's grotesque that's for, for listeners, but that's what it crazy. looks like. Um, and that's why my hand was starting to like get carpal tunnel too. Um, but but How yeah. So it? if I can't hear it properly, like you'll be off because it's it's an odd time song. You had your gro- your groove that, has to that. be on point to pull that one off. So let's talk about some of that. Like okay, so we were we were we have already discussed some of the. Um, Boom Boom Out Goes Lights um, and uh, Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo both sound like they're in a straightforward time. Black Dog. And they're not. Black Dog. <laughs> Another one. What time? Where they have that really weird... It's, yeah, it's like... Exactly. That's what the it, yeah, I've it's ever just heard. like, here, we're going to have this gap. <laughs> we're going to go... Yeah, we're going to go 4-4, four, four, but now we're going to play 7-8 or whatever. Not to mention the riff is not it's, freaking easy to play. <laughs> no. It's in all because of the timing, groupings because of the, and yeah. the counts, all those different counts. It's not in even number counts, and it it sounds like it. That's it. It's uh, what is that? Yeah, well, he, rhythm, but, right? so he broke play, it up. Uh, he broke it up one time, and I think what he said was like they had like a one beat in the beginning, and then there was, it was four four. So yeah, so it ends right. up being like nine, but it's but it's weird because right. yeah. So anyway, um, and uh, let's see what else. What other kind of songs are like? Um, you know where you're playing in an odd. We we mentioned um, wider shade pale. Just like uh, that's another chord, one. It's not weird. just the times; it's the chord voicings and stuff are just out there. I can't imagine doing any any Frank Zappa stuff ever. Even something like Frank oh. the Slime would be like impossible. Well, you mentioned Y Y Z. You listen yeah, well, to the count. count? The beginning of I mean, that. like that song. That song exactly. is. Like, it's it Morse is, code. Yeah, that's first why I'm like, of all, it's folks. Morse code. That's like, Morse code. I'm, yeah. Why would you even attempt that? Um, I've seen people do a lot of crazy thrash metal stuff, though, and actually it work, which is pretty crazy. I mean, I've seen people get up and play Megadeth tunes with like four dudes that never met each other, you know, and you're like, huh? Um, yeah, and, yeah, and because they pull it that off. stuff's not slow. Um, but you, so, again, if you're playing a fa- like Hangar 18, yeah. Or- um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other songs that I've heard done, but I, none of them come to mind offhand. Um, Countdown to Extinction or something like that. I used to do "Don't Eat the Yellow Snow," um, and we used to do a um, Catholic whole, girls. Yeah, that I could I see that. School. I could see you doing that. Yeah, Catholic girls was it was fun. It was funny. We would go into a piece of it, yeah. and then we'd eat the "Don't Eat the Yellow Snow." Watch out where go the go. Don't you eat that yellow snow? Eat the yellow snow. We used to, yeah. We used to do. Um, I want to do uh, Saint so Alphonse when I was in high school. Breakfast. It was it was weird because I guess I didn't really think about how difficult or easy a song was. Yeah, I did well, back and, then because I would do like um, uh, "Don't Fear the yeah, Reaper," and that's actually a was great a, jam song right there. Yep, it's four continuous except chords, for the solo section. But but if you, but if, you right. if you work it out, like if you turn to the band and you're like, "Hey, look for the solo section, we're going to do this," you can get away with it. Right. 
a great jam tune. Well, one of my, one um, of my favorites. Actually, I was going to suggest you're going to do a Blue Oyster Cult song. You probably should do Godzilla, though. Godzilla, great jam tune. Very straightforward. I can hear it in my head the, right um, now. The break for the chorus is, yeah. It's just, the it, it's a circular chord progression. It's five chords, um, but they circle burning around for on you. each other. Which is funny burning because for you, it's the same one. chords as uh, Don't Fear the Reaper. Yep, yep. Which is funny because it's yeah. on the same album. No, no, it's, no not. it's not. Because Burden for they, You was they... on um, Fire of Unknown Origin and um, uh, Turn of a Friendly Card. No, Turn of a Friendly Card was um, I, I, yeah, I don't, uh, Alan Parsons. Yeah, I don't like remember was... which one on, but, but you're right. They're on different records. I think it was called and the whole thing was like they w- the reason why they went to do the they did that song because they're like, oh, well, it was a winning formula. So we wrote another song with the same chord progression, which the songs don't sound anything like, really. I mean, they don't. They don't. So. It's funny, and and they they're played with different voicings because um, don't fear the reverb. Yeah, it's open, open. and it, you can tell it's done on an S, with an SG through a basement. Yep, I mean it, you can tell. Yep, I don't know what they used on Burner for You. That sounded like a Strat in some places to me, but yeah, but that was a. Uh, oh. <laughs> By then, um, uh, what's his name, the, the guitar Dermot. player, um, Buck Dharma. He was playing. Um, uh, guitars that were given to him by another company. He still, he still uses those. Oh, he's all, he no, um, he's actually, uh, um, he is a Steinberger guy now, and he has been for a while. Oh, that's right, he's been playing Steinbergers, and he's he's yeah, a little well. Guy he's too. got that Steinberger, the Swiss cheese one that the Ed Roman made him. So, yep, the yeah, that's LSR, a, that's a wacky guitar. Swiss cheese, whatever. I thought I was playing that by Burner for You because Burner for You came out in nineteen. That'd be interesting to find out. 80? I'm, I'm going to look it up real quick. I want to say it was 80. Was um, Fire of Unknown Origin. It might have been It, it might have been earlier than that, but I thought Fire of Unknown Origin. Yeah, it was 81, but I don't think so. I don't think the yep. Steinbergers started coming out he was until playing... the late, later 80s, like the 80, 84, 85. Well, I can tell you something interesting. So I was watching, of all bands, Firefall on a television show called Nashville Now, and they were doing You Are the Woman, and I, I know that's not kind of your style of music, and I looked at the headstock and the guitar he was playing, and I'll be damned if that's not a Paul Reed Smith. On what? On the guitar that the guy from Fireball oh. was playing. So I'll have to find out. I don't know what year that was that they were on. That would have been like now, the very beginning of PRS. That would have been like a very early Paris. And it's blue. It's all blue. And it was, um, you know, the song is, You are the woman that I've always dreamed of. And I'm like, Geez, that's an old song. I, can't, I don't know what year, but Can we, an old song. And I'm like, is that a PRS? But I'm telling you, it had that the head shock state or uh, head sh- head stock shape was the um, the small point and the large point. And, and I'm like, is, is this a PRS? Sure? So I'll have to look into. So that. I'm on I'm on a very specific website for a very specific thing, um, uh-huh. and apparently they're back. Which makes me wonder because I know they were owned by a certain company that we are not supposed to be talking about. Steinberger? Yeah, Steinberger's allegedly back. Yeah. And they brought back the GT Pro, which I don't know Mm -hmm. anything. It looks like it's got a roller bridge. I saw that. I saw that on, I don't remember what, um, it wasn't uh, Anderton, but I'm going to have to be looking at these again because, not because, so I had one. Right, like I had a spirit, right, yeah. by Steinberger, um, right, and the trim system was so bad that I was like, "No, this is not even usable." But if they're coming back and they've oh. done some work <clears throat> on the, the trim, yeah, because one of the things was like they had fake roller bridges on them, right? They didn't have rollers, Oof. so in order for that system to work for that particular style of bridge, it needs to have a roller saddle. Because otherwise, the string gets bound up, and you have tuning instability yep. issues. Um, so you know that I've been looking at a particular guitar recently, and uh, for its lightweight and uh, ease of use um, from the nineties. Uh-huh. And there's another one listed in the area. I figured it was no, the same not. one, same color and everything, but it's not don't, it's a different one. Don't. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't. Super proprietary. I know. I know that's the one thing. Oh, they're about very proprietary. They're, they're expensive to fix too because yeah. if it's got glued on frets, 
instead of the set in frets, forget it. For yep. nobody will even touch it to work on it. You have to send it to like three guys because they. Well, that's why I think they're cool know, guitars, but man, if you have a problem, when you're going to have massive bills to pay. Yeah. I would love to have one, frankly. I want one of the early ones at the composite board. And all that. Jim's talking about Parker, by the way. Um, one of the early ones, like before they started blowing up, because they because they were real popular when I started playing guitar. I remember going to Guitar Center and seeing like six or seven of them hanging up, and people like coming in to get them, you know. Um, and I I was like, I dude, these guitars look great. Like in my opinion, I think the body style is like super out there, and it's kind of my thing. Um, but I remember looking at them and just going, you know, as cool as these are, like. I, who knows that there's going to be a market for them, and there isn't one. Like you look at the prices that Jim, I sent you the the eBay prices, the sale, the the actual sold listings. These things go for peanuts because they're proprietary. Yeah. If anything breaks, you got to pay. Yeah, and so this one's got stainless steel frets. That's yeah. the only upside. I think they all do. I thought all of them so, did until yeah. until the later models, when they started doing the the import yeah. ones. Um, like the mahogany bodied imports or whatever, um, those were yeah. nickel. I wouldn't get an import one anyway. It would be an American made one, but I don't know. I would have to be. I would have to go in really low on this thing. It would be insulting to even this guy. He's down. He's down at nine hundred, and I still be half of that. I'd still offer him like six or five. You know, I wouldn't offer him nine hundred. No way. So. The uh, Steinberger Spirits that are available, I'm looking through the spec sheet. They are um, they still have to use patented double ball, which is stupid. So you have to buy a block to, to be able to bolt to the top so that you can um, put on other strings. They're still using an R-trim, um, which, the, which, oh, it's fully floating. But the, what they don't tell you is it's not tension adjustable with any degree of like actually being able to be usable. The tension spring on mine was so tight that, like, I had to, like, wrench the bar, like, really hard to get it to bend at all. And it was just, it was unusable. Um, so I would not recommend these unless you see one first and you get to actually play it before you buy it. Um, I do not see, I'm looking to find out. So they do have the lock. These are kind of cool because it's a, it's a floating bridge, but it has, like, a thing you flip up and it'll hold the bridge in place. Um, so that you can tune it up and also so that it will lock it in place so that it won't go out of tune when you bend. Um, which basically you're going to need that because you're probably going to want to leave that engaged the whole time. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I, this may be the manual for the old one though. So I don't know. I'm looking for a date on this manual somewhere. But anyway. Um, oh, and in the bottom of this, they have the headpiece adapter. So you can order the part that you will need to make this guitar work permanently. Um, also of note is in the back of this manual is the phone number and email address are for Gibson. How about that, right? Like, who would have thought Gibson owned Steinberger? Uh, why, what, why not? Gibson owns everybody. They own Pioneer, for Christ's sakes. This is not a big surprise. Um, so, oh, and don't forget to follow them on the Gibson forums. <laughs> I, this is hilarious. Like, you know, I guess um I guess Jim walked away for a minute, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take over the podcast for a minute. It's fine. I, I know how to do this. Um so if Gibson is bringing back Steinberger, I heard another brand maybe making a comeback. Um vis a vis NAM, which we didn't talk about. Uh which actually we probably should have on the show, but we didn't. Um yeah, I heard that Nam is uh, that and Nam Kramer had a booth, and that some of the guitars were pretty nice, and that some of them looked awful, an awful lot like Charvel, and that they may be making a comeback. So I'm looking on their site right now. They have a site uh, that they didn't have a site before. I, it does not have an SSL certificate, folks. So, but Kramer looks like they have a they have a web presence again. Uh, and they have pictures from Nam. Yeah, <clears throat> my understanding is Kramer. That's is not a surprise. Back. We, I, now, I, what course, did I tell you, Jim? They should. Been a lot of drive for that. 
Um, they lost the, their uh, biggest endorsement, though. Do you know who was using Kramer? That probably would have sold a lot of guitars for him. When he switched. He went to Charvel. Who uh, was that? Um, the guy from Steel Panther. Satchel. Oh, that's a, right. He was a, a Kramer and Dorsey. Now, they were actually Gibsons. Custom shop Gibsons. But that, I mean, all you had to do was make him a signature model Kramer. A $350 or $400 import Kramer. You know, and people would have been like, all right, I'll buy one. Like, one, I'll buy one. We did play the, uh, we played the Charvel version at Sweetwater. And that, it was pretty cool. Um, the one they needed to, they had needed to be set up. I thought it was a cool guitar, but, um, I, I, I don't have issues with buying a guitar that has Satchel's name on it. I have issues buying a guitar with anyone's name on it. So that would have probably been the dead, you can't buy this kind of thing. But I do, I do notice in their pickup, in their pictures of the Kramers, Jim, they have, they have the, uh, the hockey stick headstock. I am, I am all over this. If this happens, if we start seeing some hockey sticks come out, I'll be like, mm, maybe, maybe. I think Kramer is one of the few guitar companies that um, their Facebook page says the legend lives on. Good. Um, Kramer is one of the few guitar companies where I feel like it. it's super niche, right? Like, not everybody's going to be into Kramer, but it's like this weird, like, I don't know, it's like a club. People who buy Kramers and play Kramers is like its own little thing where um, it's just a unique group of people. And I th- I think it's different for Charvel in a way because Charvel, Charvel was like not ever, it, it just doesn't seem like it was ever really its own company past, you know, the way Charvel years. I would buy a Wayne Guitars guitar, though. Um, and I've seen some, and they are gorgeous. And they play great, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just haven't, like, I'm not going to have the bread to call up Wayne Charvel and be like, yeah, maybe a guitar. Or his kid. Um, but Kramer, like, so Kramer's an iconic thing, right? The, the, that hockey stick headstock thing is, like, so 1980s. If they do one in, like like, hot pink with a hockey... The hockey stick headstock, like I'll be like, eh, it's gonna be hard to resist. <laughs> or the red, the the uh, the um, metal flake red. That that is going to be. I'll, I'll tell you. First of all, the pink. Um, remember the the yeah, dude, like the pink. neon like melt your um, eyes, melt your retinas out of your eyes. Pink. Yep. Yep. Those neon colors that they did the hockey stick. Um, headstock, like you said, those are the things that are going to, there's a lot of people who are, again, uh, let's say 80s, quote unquote, 80s kids. That's me. That's my era. And they have enough money to buy those things because I can't see them being any more than maybe, I don't know. Yeah. If they price them above two grand, like nobody's buying me. They got it. They got to be, that would kind of, no, honestly, their target market should be between 500 and seventeen hundred and fifty dollars. That's where they want to be. Yeah, and um, a range of models from end to end there. Um, now we know that they're this Kramer Guitars USA, so Gibson's going to be charging out the yin yang for these. So forget right. it. Just just forget about it. Uh, well, I'm hoping market. that. Actually, yeah, I'd rather exactly. just get a real one. You know what we're doing this weekend? I'm going to announce it on the show right now. Um, um, allegedly, we might be doing this this weekend. Kish and I may be going to hunt down some of the new harmonies. Um, wow! Because harmony. So, if you, for those of you who don't know, harmony harmony is back. Uh, it is being produced by uh, Music Corp or whatever. What's the name of the company? The company that owns um, Heritage. They just bought Heritage a while back, oh. and they are allegedly really good that's what i've heard um and they're being pumped out of the heritage factory so i'm kind of looking to see i'm going to call around and see if we can find a dealer that actually has them um so hopefully we'll be able to find one there and their their pricing is kind of all over the place it's not um it's not uber cheap a harmony silhouette is 1300 bucks um but you know, I hear things like 
So here's their website, right? I'm digging through right now just because we're talking about the show, just so I can know the model names. And I'm digging through, and I'm like, they have a thing that says the world's most cherished musical instrument company. Are you on crack? Like, I'm sorry, Her- I, they're not the world's most cher- cherished musical instrument company, Harmony. Like, who who got up in the morning and was like, oh, I'm, man, I really can't wait to play my Harmony. Like, you know, or I can't wait to get my brand new Harmony. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, like, exactly. No, Gibson or Fender and or PRS and or maybe Ibanez would be your four most cherished musical instrument companies. Uh, are they suggesting that, like, oh, all the harmonies are so good that, like, they're cherished? I mean, maybe. I, I don't know. I just, it just doesn't make sense. So as I look through here, like, they look like the harmonies of your. They've done a really good job of making a making a model line that looks legit. So they have the Rebel, which is like a double cutaway Les Paul um, sort of deal, kind of like a Revstar. They make a – they've only got three guitars right now. The Silhouette, which is like a Jazzmaster style with uh, gold flow pickups. And then they make a Jupiter, which I would think – you would think they would do a Strat style, right? No, the Jupiter is a Les Paul style, single cut. It's a single cut instead of a double cut. Gold foils. Oh. Um, That's interesting because that. And it comes yeah, with a mo- These come with a mono case, too. Which, okay, oh. like, I get it. Uh, you know, it's a hard sell for me. I mean, I got to play one before I can say anything. So they're Nitro. Uh, mahogany C profile, 12 inch radius, ebony. Um, they got you know your typical colors like you know pearl white, black, gold. Um, and as I look through here, like they do have uh compensated saddles and all that. And uh, the 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 big selling point is the mono case, which is kind of silly. Like that's the big selling point. Um, if you're gonna give me like a case as a selling point, give me a hard show case. Come on. Um, and for, for storage, not necessarily for transport, right? Like I get it. Um, and they want $1,300 for these. They're made in the States. I mean, I'll give them that, but I mean, it's a hard sell. I'd go buy one of the Supros. Cause you can get those on deals now. I've seen those as low as 400 bucks. And it has that weird vintage vibe, like pickup and all that stuff in it. Why would three volt necks in these? And these Jupiters, I'm going to go look at the, um, the silhouette. I want to see what they're getting for that. So this is their uh, three-bolt neck on the silhouette. Of course, mono case, of course. Um, I'm sure it's going to be nitro finished. It is. Ebony ebony fretboard on a Jazzmaster. Um, nitro, 10 to 46 strings, comes with uh, gold foil mini humbuckers. That's weird. Um, I, guess the, I guess it's not that weird. And then custom cupcake control lock. I want to play one. I, I do. Uh, again, $1,300 for this model as well. I don't know. I feel like I feel like these are... So maybe for the price, like these are, these are competitors with like other USA-made guitars. Because they're USA-made. Like I know the Super line is not USA-made. It's import. Um, but I just feel like for a weird guitar like this, like I would rather spend $1,300 on something that's like USA like standard quality like okay so I'm gonna get a standard strat or I'm gonna get a Les Paul standard or I'm gonna get an SG standard or I'm gonna get you know one of the common like USA guitars like this is like uh I would say I would be happier if it was like a thousand even you know what I mean but these are thirteen hundred and now is that thirteen map or is that thirteen hundred retail I don't know until I see one it, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. to find out these guitars are selling for grand. And if they're a thousand out the door, these are good value, and and if they're made in heritage. They're going to be every bit as good as any Strad or whatever you pick up off the shelf. These might actually be really cool. So I I have a feeling I'm going to be pleasantly surprised that these guitars are going to be great. Because how, how why else would we be charging this amount of money? I mean, you can't. I don't think anybody's going to tell. So this is this is a good a good show topic. We got a few more minutes left. We got eight minutes left. Let's let's do this. Um. Guitars, right? So, like, everybody thinks, oh, well, 
you know, I'm not going to pay, or in this case, we're not going to pay $1,300 for this because it's like kind of an off thing, right? What if, like, how, how many bad guitars have you played over 1000 bucks? Like, bad. Like, I would not buy that. Bad. Like, just, it's terrible. Like, uh, the qu- quality control not issues. Not very many. And, you know, the nuts cut wrong. And, like, I'm going to have to spend 150 or 200 bucks to pay. Now, I'm talking about new guitars I use. Because, obviously, you'll find your used beaters. Um, I, 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 my point here is, you've already kind of answered the question, Jim, but um, you're not going to find, like, $1,300 guitar, guitars that suck. They're, they're going to be good at what they are. You know what I mean? Like, whether they suck or not is totally right. subjective. So I'm sure these are going to be great at what they're supposed to do. They're not going to be great for me. I mean, unless I want to buy, like, a Sir Badger and go play blues, you know. Um, which, by the way, I've been using Sir Badger profiles the last couple of days. Uh, I don't even think it's – I think it's a Michael Britt profile. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, Sir Badger. Man, what a great blues amp. Uh, anyway, so that with one of these guitars would be what that would be killer. Uh, or a Supro. I actually think the Supros were a good alternative to the SG. Um, when I bought my SG, I was playing a Supro right next to it. I was like, man, these are really cool. It's a tough sell. Uh, but uh, they were, I, you know, honestly, the reason why I didn't buy the Supro because it was 800 bucks. It was the same price as the SG, and it was an import. And I'm going, why would I buy an import when I could buy a USA Gibson for the same price? It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Exactly. Um, and so that's why those guitars are like marked down super hard right now. Well, you know, I, I just, I find it hard to believe that, that there are people out there finding guitars according to them uh, that are in that price range. Um, that are that are bad, and it's here's my thing. Nowadays, it's even hard to find a guitar over like maybe you're muted over maybe uh, six hundred bucks that would be you, you're you're as you move up, you start to lose those little things. Now there will be like a glue spot, or there'll be you know this that or the other thing that you'll find. But as you move up towards that thousand dollar range. You just run out of things to right. You can still I, mean, I, I honestly can't think of a terrible guitar I played for under, you know, for under two fifty. Like everything of two fifty and above, the last couple of years has been. I could gig with this. Like I could, I could take this out and do a do a show with it. Now I may not do want want to do more than one, but uh, you know, I could I could make it work. Like I'd have to have it set up, obviously. But there were there were massive issues like pickup didn't work or the pickup sounds awful now i'll say like some of the guitars that i played that are under that price range in the last couple of years have still been kind of like okay this is definitely student level um but going beyond that like now you can get a gig easily giggable guitar for like 300 bucks like no problem yeah. um yeah and it may not have fender or gibson on the headstock or epiphone even for that matter but it, but I mean, you'll be happy with it for like you know what it is for, and if you're if you're realistic about what it is. So when I hear people in these forums say things like, "Oh, X guitar that cost me you know three hundred bucks is garbage, it's hot garbage," and they're like, "It doesn't compare to my Les Paul standard," and you're like, "No shit," you know, <laughs> like, of course not. It, it, you're talking about a you know a two thousand dollar price difference, you know, um, that that kind of irritates me but but to like to think that you know hey 10 years ago when i bought a 350 dollar guitar i was gonna have to do things to it to gig with it you know what i mean like i was gonna have to put new pickups in it or i was gonna have to um have you know some sort of severe neck neck adjustment or i was gonna have to put a shim in it or like that that's the kind of stuff uh that that drives me nuts but you don't see that stuff anymore you just don't no, no. I mean, I don't care whether you're talking about um, Fender Classic vibe. You're talking about, you know, your your um, mid to high end uh, Epiphones. You're talking about your uh, PRS SEs. Um, you're talking about Ibanez. 
uh, a lot of the line of Ibanez, Schachter, um, you know, uh, so many good guitars. Gretsch, Liger Import, Gretsch are in that price range. D'Angelico Imports are in that price range. A lot of really good guitars. Uh, Ibanez RG, like for, for my money right now, there's an RG. Uh, it's got um, some sort of a, I know it's a veneer, but it's a, it's a, what do they call them? A burl veneer. It's a real cheap guitar. I think it's like 350 bucks, and it has a Floyd or something crazy like that. 24 fret, typical RG, oh. deep cutaways. It's Northern Ash, so forewarning. It's heavy. Uh, and I, I played a couple yeah. of them, but man, like if I didn't have a guitar, and I, you know, like for some reason I like went through divorce and all my guitars got sold or something as part of the work. Like I would just go buy an Ivan, one of those Ivan SRGs and do a bunch of gigs to pay for the next guitar. Because to be honest with you, like they were, it played really well for, for a $350 guitar. But I can't stress this enough to everyone, like all of our listeners. Look, a $350 guitar is still a $350 guitar. Don't buy it thinking, oh, well, this guitar is so great. I'm going to get more money than what I paid for it. That's not how this works. All that means is right. it's a good guitar. And that you'll get 300 bucks mm -hmm. when you sell it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it, yeah. it just means that, that it's a good guitar. So, like, my, my thing is, part of the reason why I buy uh, higher-end instruments is because I've invested in my gear. Like, I, I continually buy things. I, I, for lack of a better word, flip things. And I try to, like, let's say I want a new guitar, right? I'll take a couple of old guitars I got. I saw them. You guys all know this. You've, you've been listening to the show long enough. You, you guys and girls have been listening to the show long enough to know that, you know, that's how I am. Um, and Jim's done the same things. So like for me, I don't really want to back up in value. I'd rather throw another hundred dollars into the equation to get me into something nicer because I'm always going to have a nice guitar. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'll just trade up. But if I was, but if I was like really budget conscious, which I, obviously I have my problems because I'm not budget conscious, uh, I would totally go buy a $350 Ibanez. Um, and I might, I might do that for the show. Uh, actually, I already did. You remember how that went, Jim? Can you, can you talk about the uh, yeah, two hundred fifty dollars so Ibanez well. I bought? <laughs> yeah, the uh, I was so ecstatic when that thing sold, man. I literally jumped up and kicked my heels together. It was crazy. And then I broke my ankle on the way down. Oh no, that was you. You broke yep. your ankle on the way down. No, because that was lit. You I broke. broke you hurt your ankle. Broke it. Whatever. On the same day that I sold that guitar, that's incredible. That I got I, one thing went out, and that's then that happened to hilarious. you. And I was like, "Somebody's got to get the curse. Like <laughs> it can't be me." Um, it's so yeah, terrible. thanks. But no, uh, yeah, I was so happy. And then, like, I expected the guy to like send me a message after he bought it and be like, "You sold me a piece of crap. Like, I hate you." Dude, it's totally cool. I'm gonna find like, you. <laughs> I, I the message I reached out to him. I was like, "Yeah, everything cool with the guitar." Like, I know it's got a lot of problems, and like, I wanted to try to be upfront. And then and he's like, "No, it's fine." He's like, "I'm I'm gonna fix it up." And I'm like, "Great, no problem then." So awesome, um, awesome. Whatever. I no 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 issue with me whatsoever. You know the funny part, Jim? I bought it from a guy in Texas. Yeah. Guess where it went to? Guy you in Texas. Sold it to a guy on in the Texas. other side of the same town. <laughs> I wonder if me. it was the same dude. Because because I bought it from the guy, and then when I shipped it back to his address that he had listed on eBay, he never picked it up. It got rejected and sent back to me. Which means he's no longer living at the address he huh. set up on his eBay account. So that might indicate that the same guy bought the guitar huh. back. That I, that's actually fun. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. Maybe his buddy bought it. Wouldn't and it be gave weird? It, gave it to him. Was like, hey, I know you had this guitar, and like I saw it online. It's possible. Because I detailed all the it damage. Might have been so I mean, that he it would have been easy to identify it. Oh yeah, and he got spare parts back with it. Which that <laughs> that would be par for the course. Like the guy actually would have cheated me at that point. So whatever. Um. Got you. I, don't buy know. I made money parts. on the deal because when I sold it, I actually got a little bit more than I paid for it. So, which was nothing. Yeah. Um, 
because you know, remember he, I did get my money back because he did lie to me in the listing, and then I sent it back to him, and then he didn't accept it, and so then for I got back to me, and then I called eBay and asked what the heck, what I should do with it, and they said keep it. So I kept it, and then oh, I yeah, sold it yeah. because it was a piece of crap. Um, and I bought. I uh, actually haven't bought anything. Well. I took the money to GearFest with me. So technically, I probably did buy something. I probably bought this crappy pre sonus interface. That's the curse. It came back to me. Um, no, I, I, so, I mean, I, technically, I had the conversation with and I said, well, you know, I sold the SG and I took the cash out so that you could find a place to hide it for me. And I told her that. And then she says, uh, I told her, I said, I have a thousand bucks. And she goes, that, wasn't it that you didn't sell an SG for a thousand? And I said, Well, I have 250 left over from this other thing, and I was going to roll some of that in there. And she says, No, you took that money to Gearfest. <laughs> and I said, uh, Well, we could have that conversation later if you'd like. Um, yeah. And <laughs> let's let me put it to you this way I did not hand her a thousand dollars from the SG, but I got I, it was real close. <laughs> There, there was a bit of a negotiation. Very there, close, and, and and I may have lost. <laughs> um, no, I definitely lost because I don't fight with people, especially not people I live with who know where I sleep. No. Um, I, I'm a sensible person, and <laughs> I like to live. Um, so, but so you know, I, I I'm thrilled with that with that whole thing. Though, so on the SG, I'm ready for a new guitar. It's going to be like, uh, it's going to be a couple. It, there's more time. I can sell some other stuff before I can get into the guitar, but. Um, I'm kind of going back and forth on specs and I'll, and I'll spill the beans. I was going to get, um, I was going to get Osiris, which is their headless strat style guitar, but I was going to get it purple with flame maple, gold pickup covers, black pickup screws, black bridge. So it would be a Royal guitar and it would have a gold drop leaf logo on it. So it would be purple, brown and gold. And then I was going to get uh baked maple. Um, bird's eye board and regular baked, ma baked, baked maple neck. I have since changed my mind and I'm probably just going to get something a little bit more run of the mill, but it, I'm not going to do, I don't think I'm going to do the, um, or the, uh, baked maple, but I am going to do a Southern ash body. No. And I want this guitar to be light and ergonomic. That's going to be, that's going to be the thing. So, um, yeah, well, that was the reason I was looking at the Parkers. I know the Parkers come in really light. Uh, I mean, that Parkers was uh, like Joni pounds, Mitchell. I think. Yeah, Joni Mitchell was playing those. That's the reason. She, that was the average weight of the Kiesel is about six pounds. So they're about the same. Yeah. Um, I think. So they say two kilos, which is four point five pounds for a Parker. Yep, that's crazy. Yeah, they're very light. How do they? How do they sustain? Yep, that's well. I'd have to try one. You know, they're gonna resonate like a mother. It's tough, I but mean, how are they gonna sustain? So, yeah. like, that's the thing. My Kiesel, um, exactly. So, I got, I got the Kiesel. I have the Kiesel. I'm hearing like, I'm hearing like thumping. Um, the Kiesel. I <gasps> okay, all right. That was the, me doing uh, the Kiesel that. I've got is um, <laughs> it's uh. <laughs> What is it? Uh, Karina, black Karina, like the dark Karina, and it's heavy. Yep. Um, and they told me like this is the heaviest wood we have, other than Koa. And I paid to get the lightest piece of Karina they had, and it is still heavy. <laughs> it still weighs like probably the headless guitar, right? Seven string, seven string. So it's got more weight. Yeah. Right. That's automatically going to add a pound. Yeah. That if well, not two pounds. Right. Um, so, but it's, it's like eight pounds. It's not terrible, but it's definitely not as light as no. I was going for either. Um, but I did want, I, I wanted a, an exotic wood body. Like that was kind of the thing I, I consider Karina is slightly exotic. So, um, I have no, no negative stuff to say, but I, I, the next one will be Ash. And, and there's a reason for that. So like Swamp Ash is, um, I have another guitar. It's Ash. It's Northern Ash. It's heavy. But the the sound is very different between the two guitars, and I know that I need to be able to have another guitar that has seven strings that sounds totally different. 
um, because I need to be able to double track. And that's that's the reason why I'm doing this. So. Yeah, well, I know that the reason jo that uh, Joni switched to the Parkers when she was she was getting older was they have the great they have a great piezo system. And they're extremely light. And she is a alternate tuning, like all over the place kind of guitar girl. So, um, well, you know, and that's true. They did have a great piezo when they came out. Yep. Um, now that piezo system is available in damn near everything because it's a fishman. So any system, any guitar that you have that has a piezo in it is going to be comparable to what the Parker Flight could do when it first came out. Yeah. But I mean, what they are, if you get a decent one, like you're looking at the the fly standard or whatever the the you're not looking at like the really high end one. No, it's that, a fly those standard. Are really good guitars for that amount of money. They go for about six hundred bucks, folks. Yeah. And but again, if you have to replace the bridge, cough up four hundred dollars because that's what it's gonna cost. Yeah. If you have to replace anything on the electronics, just start coughing up money. I know people who've been gutting them and putting fishmans in them. Fishman Moderns and Fishman Fluence pickups. Fishman Fluence Moderns, whatever. They've been putting Fishman Fluence pickups in them because they're like, yeah, they, if the, if you don't like the sound of guitar, like, Fishmans are great. Um, I think the Fishmans are fantastic pickups in anything, but um, I don't know, man. Like, and the, I, guy I, from, I, the guy from Grand Funk Railroad was playing one. If you're... Oh, I don't care who plays them. Like you, we just talk about it. I don't care who plays them. No, I'm just it, saying that that they had a certain um a group of people that were playing them at that time. Now of course that was in the nineteen ninety seven, so it was the late nineties. Well we on the plus side, at that price you could buy two of them and swap parts back and forth. <laughs> so I mean, or you could buy a couple of because they're only six hundred bucks. I mean, they go for between three hundred and seven hundred dollars. Is that what they're actually selling for? Yeah. I sent you the link. Yeah, I don't have that. They don't I'm go. They go for like nothing, man. Yeah. They're because because they're like they're a very specific guitar, and people think they're fugly. Oh, um, they are fugly. There's no. Oh, I, I no. I love the link. When there Vernon Reed when look. Vernon Reed came out with the Parker Fly signature that he was playing, I went. This is the perfect guitar for him. Nothing yeah. says Vernon Reed like a Parker Fly. <laughs> Well, for me, <clears throat> it's all about weight, and that's only if it's if it sounds good and has good weight. Well, weight ergonomics is another part. The thing I didn't like about the Parkers, they, they had a really thin neck. They have a very thin neck. I mean, if that you're much I about, remember. If you're concerned about weight, you might want to look at like Kiesel or something like that, where you can do a lightweight option and then get the lightest weight wood they offer as well. You can get a Kiesel with a headstock for like. That for like you know fifteen hundred bucks, that's going to be like seven pounds. You want to hear something funny with a headstock? You want to hear something funny? I've considered doing. Sure. So at Guitar Center, they have my Telecaster, <sighs> right? They got Excuse another me, one in folks. stock. And uh, I've thought about taking my Telecaster in there, trying it out, and then when nobody's watching, switch. <laughs> because the one there is a good pound and a half lighter than. That's so funny. All right, all right, all right. Good. Pass. So we're over we're a at, pound and a half. It's not worth it, Jim. No, I'm just kidding. So and, and I believe it or not, I've changed out. So I've got um, locking uh, strap locks and everything else on mine. Well, that's why it's heavier. Yeah, those strap locks they weigh a ton. No, but the locking tuners will will weigh it down. No, they have locking tuners. Oh, it's they're a, on all the models. All yeah, right, yeah. gotcha. All right, so All right, that, we're, we're, it's been it's been plenty of time. I've been David. I've been Jim, and I like cutting him off. We've I, been the practical guitarists. Good night. <laughs>